We're so happy you're here. Fry, yay. And boy, do we have a good show for them, Savannah. Oh, it's going to be a good one. Now, for those of you who don't know, this is Today in 30. It's a showcase of the top segments across all four hours of our show. And you guessed it. We give it to you in just 30 minutes. So let's get it started. All right. First up, we're going to have the very latest on President Biden's first overseas trip in office as the G7 summit gets underway. Also ahead, it's the new space race and a battle of the billionaires. Who's going to get there first, Jeff Bezos or Sir Richard Branson? Tom Costello's got that story for us. And then we're going to meet the 43-year-old. That's right, 43-year-old mother of four who won 21 years ago. She won gold 21 years ago. It's an inspiring mission to return to the Olympics. Then Steve Kornacki and his khakis are back at the big board, this time breaking down the Westminster Dog Show. Melvin, I know you got to see it. I am. I'm a big fan of the dog shows, you know. Plus, we got a fix-ahead Friday meal that you can whip up today, enjoy all weekend. Today in 30 starts right now. NBC's chief White House correspondent, Peter Alexander, joins us from the site of the G7 summit. Peter, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning to you. As you know, this is the first G7 summit in two years. Last year's gathering that was supposed to take place in the United States was canceled due to the pandemic. And the pandemic is going to be central to the conversations that take place here as those world leaders arrive here just this morning. President Biden really hoping to rally America's allies on a series of pressing issues. With the G7 summit beginning this morning, President Biden walking a delicate line in Cornwall in his first major in-person summit, aiming to present a united front and restore alliances that his predecessor, former President Trump, attacked. While looking ahead to a high-pressure meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin next week. Today, the topics expected to drive Mr. Biden's discussions, coronavirus, climate change, and cyber threats. The president's first order of business here, fortifying America's long-standing friendship with the U.K., Connecting in person with Prime Minister Boris Johnson for the first time since taking office. I've been in my great country many times, but this is the first time as President of the United States. Everybody's absolutely thrilled to see you. The two leaders renewing the Atlantic Charter, a post-war declaration of cooperation first signed by FDR and Winston Churchill. On the pandemic, Mr. Johnson announcing the other G7 nations will match the U.S.'s 500 million dose donation, meaning 1 billion shots will be sent to nearly 100 nations, most in need. We're doing this to save lives. The move follows pressure on the president to do more with a stark divide in vaccination rates around the world. 52% of Americans have received at least one shot, but in Asia, it's just 6%, and in Africa, only 2%. First Lady Jill Biden, who traded heels for flip-flops alongside Mrs. Johnson on the beach, stealing the show, the Johnson's son, Wilfred. The First Lady earlier sharing her own message of goodwill, the word love outlined on the back of her jacket. Well, I think that we're bringing love from America. The Bidens, after hours, relaxing outside the converted castle that's their hotel. How's it going, Mr. President? You enjoying it here? I'm <laughs> And this morning, First Lady Jill Biden is meeting for the first time with Kate Middleton, the Duchess of Cambridge. The two of them will be touring a school here, 34 and 5-year-olds. It'll be quite a scene there. And this evening, a very special gathering. We have just learned that Queen Elizabeth is now going to be coming here to Cornwall, Prince Charles, as well as other members of the royal family for a reception with the Bidens and the other G7 leaders. It's going to be one of the most high-profile appearances by the Queen since the passing of her husband, Philip. Savannah? All right, that's what's happening overseas. But back home, a bipartisan group of senators just announced an infrastructure deal with a big price tag. Uh, what is the agreement and, and what are the chances here? Well, so this is significant progress, that announcement being made by this group of 10 bipartisan senators. And what's significant is it's about $1.2 trillion over eight years. So the number does appear to be growing. It's going to focus almost exclusively on core physical infrastructure like roads and bridges and pipes. No tax increases here. What's unclear is whether there are an additional five Republican senators who would have to join all the Democrats for this to pass. In the White House, it still has to review this deal. It's already expressing some concerns about how it would be paid for. Savannah. Peter Alexander traveling with the president. Peter, thank you very much.
Also this morning, there's a concerning development in the fight against the virus. The CDC has scheduled an emergency meeting today to discuss growing evidence that certain vaccines may be linked to a heart issue in teens and young adults. We're going to talk about that with Dr. Ashish Jha in just a moment. But first, NBC's Morgan Chesky with our report. Morgan, good morning. Well, Savannah, good morning to you. And this study found higher than normal cases of heart inflammation in patients under 30 after their second shot. Meanwhile, here outside Houston Methodist, more than 100 staffers are refusing to get the shot and are now headed to court. From the exam room to the courtroom, this morning, new fronts in the fight against COVID-19. The CDC finding 16 to 24 year olds who receive the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine have experienced higher than normal cases of myocarditis and inflammation of the heart muscle. Myocarditis symptoms can include fever and fatigue, shortness of breath and chest pain. The CDC said the higher rate of cases occurred, especially among young men following their second dose of an mRNA vaccine. But notes the reports are rare given the number of vaccine doses administered and that most patients quickly felt better after receiving care. Federal officials calling it a clear imbalance, but adding more research needs to be done to confirm whether the vaccines are to blame. The benefits of getting vaccinated far, far, far outweigh any of the potential um, risks or side effects. The FDA turning its attention to kids. A top advisor now saying all children should be vaccinated, stressing herd immunity is critical with more contagious variants on the way. Now under FDA review, Moderna's new COVID vaccine, specifically for 12 to 17 year olds. But in Texas at Houston Methodist, doubts over all the vaccines have led to legal action. You're willing to lose your job over this. Yes. Tell me why. Because I am not going to take that vaccine. Jennifer Bridges, one of 117 hospital workers, now part of a mass action lawsuit suing Houston Methodist for its policy requiring all staff to be vaccinated or terminated. The hospital thanking the more than 24,000 other employees who followed policy. What the mandate has allowed us to do is go that last mile and get everybody vaccinated so we have every layer of protection for our patients that we possibly can. And a court hearing has been set up for later today regarding that lawsuit here at Houston Methodist. And they are far from the only hospital group to have a vaccine mandate. John Hopkins Medicine, based in Baltimore, Maryland, has a similar rule in place. No pending litigation there so far. There's a whole lot more coming up on Today in 30. Stick around. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Right now on NBC News Now. They've done things like installing cameras to help alert Border Patrol to people crossing. They are escaping a number of conditions there, of uh, violence and persecution in their home countries. Everybody, welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. <laughs> Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. We're back. Chanel joins us with a fascinating battle of the billionaires playing out in the latest space race. Yes, it started with Jeff Bezos saying he's going to fly into space next month. But now Sir Richard Branson is reportedly hoping to beat him there. Yeah, NBC's Tom Costello covers space for us. Tom, good morning. A lot of money and a lot of egos involved in this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's to say the least. So you've got you got Richard Branson from Virgin. You've got Amazon's Jeff Bezos. Now they have both built spaceships to carry tourists into space. The question now is going to be which one of them will be first. It's Branson versus Bezos. It's billionaire versus billionaire. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. Forget the last space race. Neil Armstrong and NASA won that hands down. This space race is going to be much closer. In one corner, West Texas actually, Amazon's Jeff Bezos, the founder of space tourism business Blue Origin. In the other corner, just up the road in New Mexico, Virgin Galactic founder Richard Branson. Both companies have launched successful test flights, preparing for future paying passengers. And we have liftoff. Go, New Shepard, go. Bezos Blue Origin will eventually carry up to six passengers remote control, rocketing into suborbit for three minutes of flying weightless. Fire. Fire. Virgin Galactic is building an entire fleet of spaceships piloted by astronauts, also carrying six passengers for the ride of their lives and a spectacular view. Wow, look at that view. Gorgeous. But which billionaire will go first? This week, Bezos announced he'll join the first passenger flight on July 20th, the anniversary of that first moon landing. It changes your relationship with this planet, with humanity. And he's bringing his brother, Mark. I really want you to come with me. Would you? Are you serious? I am. Well, any self-respecting space billionaire could not let that stand. Branson tweeted his congratulations, but space blog Parabolic Arc reports Branson is planning to jump into a Spaceship Two rocket plane over the July 4th weekend, beating Bezos by two weeks. Virgin Galactic is not commenting or denying the report. Two years ago, I asked Branson about his astronaut plans. You are really training hard to go to space. I am working on getting a, a body that's nearly 70 years old you know, into a fitness state of a 20-year-old. There are other billionaires. Billionaire Jared Isaacman is paying billionaire Elon Musk for his own private trip. We met up with both in February. Elon, when are you going to fly? I don't know. Um, I'd like to fly at some point, uh, and I will. He may not be the first to fly himself, but Elon Musk has already won the race to get real astronauts to the space station. Musk, Bezos, and Branson's companies have all suffered setbacks, including a test pilot who died flying an early version of the Virgin Galactic spaceship in 2014. In the end, Bezos versus Branson may all come down to billionaire bragging rights and a spectacular ride for anyone who can afford a very quick joy ride into space. And we are now just 42 days away from the Tokyo Olympics, and that means it is crunch time for athletes dreaming of grabbing a spot on Team USA. <laughs> Laura Wilkinson joins us from the U.S. Diving Trials in Indianapolis. Hi, Laura. Good morning. Hi, Savannah. Thanks for having me on today. This is just so fun to watch this comeback, this story. Uh, how, have you surprised yourself at how far you've made it? Um, I'm kind of just surprised I'm doing it, honestly. Like I, when I retired at 30, I was old back then. So uh, yeah, this, this whole journey has just been a crazy fun road. I know, and you know, you, you've got the gold medal. You've got the Wheaties box. You've got the three Olympics under your belt. So what is motivating you this time around? It's just the love of doing it. You know, when you feel called to do something and you're passionate about it, you just want to be all in. And it's it's the drive, it's the love. And, and I love that my kids get to watch me do this, not just me telling them how to live their lives, but they're seeing me, the blood, sweat, and tears that it takes to actually get there. It's an incredible message for your kids to see. But I have to tell you, Laura, when I saw your mother's face, there she is, back at the meet, living and breathing every dive with you. Was she happy to see your return? <laughs> she, the first thing she said to me was, do I have to come to all your meets? And I said no, and I'm actually surprised she wanted to come this time. And she's actually kind of watching me, which is a big deal. Oh, yeah, she thought she retired too from being a mom who has to be nervous on the sidelines there. What do your kids say? 
Um, well, I think my older kids, I've got one that are one that's nine and one that's 10, and they kind of understand what's going on, and they're getting really into it. But my little ones, they just, they, they get excited. They want to clap and cheer, but then they're like, can we just go home and play now? <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, this has not been an easy road either. I mean, we, we mentioned it briefly. You went through a surgery. You had, uh, you had to stop training for a while because there were complications with your adoption of one of your little ones. And you kept fighting. You kept coming back. That's, I mean, that's just who I am, I think, you know, and when you feel really called to do something, you've got to be all in, you know, and it's, it's never going to be an easy road, but that's what makes the journey worth it. You know, when you get through the other side, whether you achieve all your goals and your dreams or you don't, going through all of that, it refines you as a person. It's walking through that fire and, and you become better in the process. It's so interesting when you say the call, you know, what is calling you? I mean, I feel like God made it very clear that this is where I need to be. When their doors were shut and we thought there was no way through, he made a way. He opened doors that weren't there before. And so I feel very much like this is exactly where I need to be. I don't know why, but I love getting to do this again. And who knows how long that's for, but I'm just trying to love and soak up every moment. Well, maybe because you're inspiring a lot of people right now with this story. Laura, I know you, you're a realist too. You've done well, you've made it this far. It's hard to make the Olympic team. What do you think of your chances and are you hopeful? You know, I had a really rough day in the prelims and semis and so that was unfortunate, uh, but I live to fight another day. I get to go to finals, I'm really excited. I just wanna put a list together. I wanna do everything the best that I can, walk away feeling proud whether I end up on that team or not. Well, you've done a comeback a few times before, haven't you? I believe that's how it went down in Sydney in 2000. So, so I'm, I'm putting my bets down on you, Laura. <laughs> well, thanks. I guess I like a little drama. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, best of luck to you. Enjoy every moment. Congratulations on all your success. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. nice. We're going to do our part and get vaccinated live. A very special naturalization ceremony. This is a really inspiring group. Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. Tonight, the CDC's new outdoor mask guidelines. What change that allowed this new recommendation to be made? If we do nothing, what happens to a city like Houston? You're going to repeat this movie over and over again. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Tonight, the CDC's new outdoor mask guidelines. What changed that allowed this new recommendation to be made? If we do nothing, what happens to a city like Houston? You're going to repeat this movie over and over again. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. I joined Ellen on her set, what's been a difficult year for her personally and for her show. Very few people go through such huge public humiliation. How can I be an example of strength and perseverance if I give up and run away? Right now on NBC News Now. Here in Chicago, about 20,000 middle schoolers returning to school today. They also took advantage of existing vaccine distribution networks throughout Alaska. Ready actors. An indie horror film, a talented young actress, and a deadly shot. Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Role. Action! Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. Tonight, the CDC's new outdoor mask guidelines. What changed that allowed this new recommendation to be made? If we do nothing, what happens to a city like Houston? You're going to repeat this movie over and over again. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Killer Role, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. We've seen Steve do it all, from analyzing elections, covering basketball. Last week I caught him covering the horse race. That's right. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. Well, now he's going to the dogs. Literally. Literally. That's right. Here to break it all down, the Westminster Kennel Club dog show, NBC News political correspondent Steve Fernacki. Oh. oh, Steve, was it rough oh. studying up on the dog show? I, I got to tell you, I'll pause now. This, oh, yeah, I bet you got a few more lined up there too. This is this is an event I look forward to every year because every year there are like five breeds of dogs that I never even knew existed, <laughs> and it turns out they can win awards. All right, so so what's the history of, of the dog shows, Steve? It lengthy. How about this? How long have they been doing the Westminster Kennel Club dog show? The, the first car 
hadn't even been, been oh, invented. Wow. 1877 uh. was the year of the first dog show. This is the first car. This is the Benz. This came out about a decade later. Also, there were no light bulbs. There was no light. Oh, my goodness. At the wow. first. Had to do it in daylight hours. That was a few yeah. years off. How about the zipper? The zipper wasn't even patented until the 1890s. The dog show is is older than all of these things. So, wow. I didn't realize that. Did you guys know that? There are um, new eligible breeds to compete this year. Can you tell us what they are? And like I said, this is my favorite part. You find out about these breeds of dogs that you didn't even know existed this year. Here are some of the new ones. This one's pronounced Barbet. You can see here sort of the wiry, rough coat. That's the that is the French word Barbet for beard. So there's a beard like Mm. there. They say this is a joyful dog, an intelligent dog. But if you're a bird, watch out because this is used in waterfowl hunting. So keep that in mind. You've got the beaver, pronounced beaver terrier. This is a little controversial. A lot of people say. What's the difference between a beaver terrier and a Yorkshire terrier? There was rigorous genetic testing that was done to determine wow. this is a distinct breed. And now dog. comes in the first time. And this is my favorite one, the Dogo Argentino. This, one. this is a fierce dog. This thing is, it has been used in oh, big no. game hunting. Oh. These dogs have taken down wild down boars. I'm not kidding you. And this year, a breed in the dog show. Wow. 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 Kornacki, you continue to impress and amaze <laughs> yeah. with, with, your, with the homework that you do for these segments. How, how are the competitors, how are they categorized, Steve? Yeah, so you got the breeds here, but they put a bunch of different breeds in groups. So you've got basically seven core groups here. They compete within the group, then the winner from each group, that it becomes sort of the playoffs for uh, the best in show. So these are the different groups they've arranged them into. This This is the big one historically. Terriers, believe it or not. No Mm. group has produced more winners. Look at that. 47 best in show winners from Terriers. By far, uh, this is the most successful. Bred to hunt and kill vermin. Hey, no one likes vermin. So maybe (laughs) maybe that has something to do with it. Uh, This is actually, if you look at the non-sporting group, it produced the most recent winner. This was a standard poodle last year. And this group here, the herding group, German Shepherds would be in this group. Okay. It's a little bit new. It's only in the last 40 years, but only two winners have ever come out of this. Hey, maybe it's the year for the maybe German Shepherd. Maybe it is the year. Really quickly, we know these dogs have some fun names. Any that stand out over the recent years? Oh, we got some good ones here. Yeah, take a look here. Uh, go back. Special Times Just Right 2001. <laughs> okay. I like this one right here. Rocky Top Sundance Kid in 2006. <laughs> but I think the all-time favorite, you go to 2013. At very low. We call him Banana Joe. Banana, Banana Joe. Joe won in 2013. I think no one's topped that one. Who's Banana the favorite, Joe. Steve? Is, do, you, do we have a favorite going into the weekend? It, Who should I put my money on? It, it's wide open, but history says put your money on a terrier. A yeah, terrier. always there you a go. terrier. There you Steve go. Kornacki, 41 years old, 147 in dog years. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks Who knew? so much, Steve. Thank really you. Thank you. What is Hey, it's Steve Kornacki at the Big Board. You're watching Today in 30. You know, we're breaking down the Westminster Kennel Club dog show. Here you got the different groups they competed. I, here's one interesting thing. I, I learn a lot every time I watch the dog show. Here's something interesting I learned. One of the groups, it's called the Sporting Group. The, the Labrador Retriever is like the most popular dog in the United States for people to have as a pet. This is the group it competes in. It has never, ever won Best in show. They're the most popular dog in the country. In, in a, a, a sporting event that goes back to 1877. Hey, maybe this is the year for the lab. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. right. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. A huge lift is underway for one of the most celebrated cities in this country, Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah. This is the greatest location in the nation. <laughs> We're having a baby. Wow. The big reveal is under the lid. <laughs> hey now. Things are looking brighter, so we want to help you find the fun in 21. <laughs> Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. 
half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. Our Across America journey here in Louisville, Kentucky. Cleveland. Reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Okay, if it's going to be a beautiful weekend in your neck of the woods, don't spend it inside cooking. We've got a fix-ahead Friday meal from our friend today, food stylist, Anthony Catrino. And this week, Anthony's new show, Saucy, premiered on the Today All Day channel on Peacock and on Today.com. So, to celebrate, Anthony is cooking up something very special for all of you at home. Take a look. Hey, Jenna. Hey, Willie. I'm here in the brand new Today All Day kitchen, which is the home of my show, Saucy, and I have got the perfect fix it Friday for you. And it all starts with these roasted summer vegetables. So on the sheet pan, I have some beautiful cherry tomatoes, some yellow squash and some zucchini. And basically all you wanna do is cut them into like three quarter inch chunks. You want to match the size of the tomatoes so that everything cooks nice and evenly. So just a quick chop, nothing fancy. Add it to the sheet pan. I'm using two because you want to give your vegetables room on the sheet pan when roasting so that they don't steam. And all there is to it, nice drizzle of olive oil, about a quarter of a cup per sheet pan. And use really good extra virgin olive oil. And then just some seasoning. Salt is really important when roasting. You want to be generous. Use a little bit more than you think is the right amount. It really sucks up the salt and it'll be bland tasting if you don't go on the heavy side here. And then some freshly ground black pepper. So we're not really looking for color. We just want to cook them till they're fork tender, about 18 minutes or so in a 400 degree oven. And when they come out, they're beautiful and delicious, look just like this. So I let them cool, you can do this early in the week, late in the week, and use them for days afterwards. So I'm gonna make one of my favorite things, especially during the summer, a delicious farro salad. So farro is my grain of choice for this, but you can use quinoa, you can use even rice. I just love the chewy texture of farro. So that get put right on top a bed of baby arugula. In go our roasted summer vegetables, then one of my favorite cheeses. Ricotta salada, nice dry salty cheese, some salt and pepper for seasoning, and then just add your favorite Italian dressing. Mine is my white balsamic vinaigrette, and you can learn how to make it on the first episode of Saucy. So as little or as much as you like to taste, I like a very heavily dressed salad, especially farro. It really sucks it up. So just add as much as you need to. If you make the salad in advance, when you take it out to eat, just taste it again. You may need to add just a skosh more dressing. And that's all there is to it. It's beautiful, it's delicious, and it's all yours. Another great make ahead, a frittata. This is one of those easy to make dishes. It's a perfect way to kind of empty out whatever is in your fridge using all those leftovers. So into the eggs, some pecorino, for saltiness flavor, some salt and pepper, whisk it up, and some heavy cream. We'll get that all nice and combined. Then all that's left to do is layer your flavor. So our roasted summer vegetables, some of that leftover baby arugula from our farro salad, some cheese, you always need cheese in a frittata. I'm using an Italian cheese blend, but any melty cheese is great here, and Eggs right on top. Make sure everything is submerged, especially that arugula so it doesn't burn, into a 375 degree oven just until the eggs are set, about 30, 35 minutes. And breakfast, lunch, dinner, a snack, everything is served. Hey everyone, Anthony Contrino here. 
You know me from my show Saucy, which you can watch right here on Today All Day. One other tip when roasting vegetables is to do so at a high temperature, at least 400 degrees, and really let your oven preheat. Don't forget to tune into my show. New episodes air every Monday and Wednesday at 11 a.m. right here on Today All Day. Have a great weekend. All right, that's a great tip. Thank you, Anthony. Yeah. You know what, folks, you're gonna wanna be with us next week. We've got a huge milestone. The one and only Tina Fey will be our first live guest in studio, in the flesh, since this pandemic. It's all coming back, it's all coming back. Plus, we're gonna talk to uh, Bruce Springsteen. That's right, we're gonna talk to the boss about his new killer collaboration. We're gonna see you Monday morning, right here on Today. Have a fantastic weekend. For joining us on Today All Day. Over in the next 30 minutes, I'll share some of my favorite interviews with you. These conversations include interviews with inspiring women, chatting all things books with a few of my favorite authors, and of course, some funny moments in between. So sit back and relax as Today All Day continues. I'm Jenna Bush Hager, and I'm here with Brandi Carlisle, who has written a new beautiful memoir called Broken Horses. Brandy, to write a memoir is like a, a major thing, right? Because you're putting out all, a lot of you. You're telling these stories that maybe you only told yourself. What was the process like? It was kind of quick because for me, it was like a stream of consciousness, you know? I was starting to find myself wanting to write more when I would finish a song, but I would go, okay, well, you know, it has to be three and a half minutes and, you know, I should stop writing. And so, um, you know, one day I sort of just didn't stop. Now, what was the difference? So you are the songwriter and prolific one at that. Um, what, what was the difference in process? Where did you write? Do you write sort of in the same way as when you write your songs as you did this memoir? I think that the big, biggest difference is that, um, I can't wrap anything in metaphor. You know what I mean? There's like, and I can, I can get poetic sometimes and I can play with words a little bit, but for the most part, I just had to sort of tell the truth. Although I was just about to ask you about the metaphor of broken horses. So I guess there's some metaphor still left. I you managed know, like... a couple of them there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about that, about the title. Well, it is it is a metaphor, but it's also very literal, you know? My daughter, Evangeline, she's seven. She's my greatest teacher and my arch nemesis and best friend. She uh, was curled up in bed with me and Catherine one morning while we were discussing the title of the book because we didn't have one. And there was a working title and I was starting to hate it. And uh, so we were discussing titles and we were talking about the themes in the book and um, me growing up poor came up in the conversation. And Evangeline's been asking for a pony or a horse since damn near since she could talk. And I've always told her, I'm like, no, horses are expensive. Like, you're not getting a horse until you can have a responsibility and work to support it and all these different soapbox lines. <laughs> and so she's, she hears this whole thing about me, me growing up poor. And she says, so wait, mom, you said that you, when you grew up, you were poor. And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, but you had two horses. Well, I was given broken ones. And she goes, huh. You should call your book Broken Horses. It, it exploded into a cacophony of, of metaphors, many of them, for myself, mm -hmm. for people that I try to bring into my music and life, and also for um, just the, the unbrokenness of those majestic creatures, sort of paralleling. Well, now, now, are you getting our horse? <laughs> no. <laughs> There's been talk of, of uh, two horses, um, one for... One for me and one for her at some point. In your book, you write about, I mean, it starts with a sickness, you know, with you and a coma. It starts with the fact that you had meningitis as a little girl. Did you find comfort in books? Oh, yeah. I was a reading fool. That is something that I just did all the time. I was always under the covers with a flashlight reading books. I read every boxcar children, everything in the babysitter's club, all the scary books, goosebumps, stories to tell in the dark. And I started getting into YouTube. 
Yeah, I think we're about this. We must be similar age because that was all my reading. Your, that's your jam. Yeah, yeah. Are you, are you 40? I'm turning 40. Yeah. Same. Same. <laughs> Same age. So those were my books and I was so into them. And then I hit um, 11 years old and I, I fell in love with Elton John over a fifth grade book report. I read a book about a boy who died of AIDS, Ryan White. Yeah, um, in I read that book. And I'm this 12 year old little girl. I read it. And through that book, I discovered Bowie and Elton and the Beatles, U2, George Michael and Freddie Mercury. And that changed my life. Before that, I was just a, a country singer little kid who's a country singer and so books I think books have given me uh, pretty much most of what I am and and uh, I owe them a lot I know Cormac McCarthy was a um, an inspiration to you not only in and that you loved his books but also in songwriting talk about other authors that have inspired well Cormac McCarthy he can write some really really dark stuff too I think it can really be beautiful lend itself to Americana songs so Early on in my writing, it really influenced my my writing. And then in terms of intellectually and spiritually stimulating writers, I've been really influenced by Tara Westover, who wrote mm -hmm. Educated. Have you read that? Yeah, I love I love oh. that book. So I, I felt really inspired by Educated and the fact that I struggled with an education you know yeah. my whole life I failed out of everything and then finally dropped out of high school early uh, in my sophomore year so I think it's fascinating when people overcome these monumental you know seemingly insurmountable obstacles to do amazing things I mean she has a PhD I still don't even have a high school diploma or even a GED but I feel smarter having written, written the book and um, it's done a lot for me The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast, free wherever you get your podcasts. It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high-profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Congratulations to Lester Holt, the most trusted TV news anchor in America on receiving the prestigious Edward R. Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award for a career dedicated to excellence in journalism. What's about to happen on our plaza is you're all going to get your very first COVID vaccine. I'm excited. She's excited. Three, two, one, champion. So grateful. That close to crime. Here we go. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Killer Role, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. I was going to say, it must have been liberating in some ways to write, not only because you're sh sharing your story, which is empowering in itself, but also for someone who dropped out of school where you a soft 16, a sophomore in, in high school, to then write a beautiful <laughs> memoir is like, okay, well, let's take that to the high school class. You know, like there's... <laughs> Oh my God. You know, the thing about my schooling is like my teachers, Lord, did they try? They tried so hard and I just couldn't for some reason, um, learn in, in that environment. And there was nothing wrong with the environment. And, um, I'll, I'll just never forget how much public school tried and I'll never blame that system for me not being able to finish. There was just something about my mind and how I was growing that couldn't apply myself at that time but I'm making up for lost time now and uh, even though I didn't have finished my education I'm proud of the of the little one that I did have yeah and the continuation of it like you're still curious and learning every single day it seems and um, so what what are 
some of your favorite books? And I know you live on kind of a compound with a lot of different people in your family and the people you love. Do you all share books? Do you, um, is that part of the culture there? Oh yeah, we have all been passing around Untamed by Glennon Doyle. We all love that book. Um, me when Elton put it out, uh, more myself when Alicia put, Alicia Keys put hers out. Velvet Elvis by Rob Bell was hugely uh, spiritually affirming for me. And then Ragamuffin Gospel by Brenna Manning is probably my favorite and most inspirational book that I think I've, I've ever read. You know, and I love the term ragamuffin, you know, because I don't think there's ever been a word that describes me or my kind more. <laughs> what about with your kids? Do you read to them? Are there favorite books in y'all's home? Oh, yeah. We've got The Very Hungry Caterpillar. We've got Mommy, Mama, and Me is a big one. Both my kids can recite that uh, oh. lo long before the Pledge of Allegiance. They can <laughs> recite Mommy, Mama, and Me. I read that the Bible is the most formative book in your life. Um, I wonder how many times have you read it and what, like, for, for what reasons uh, do you find strength in it? Well, I've read sections of it thousands of times, and um, but the whole thing, once. And I read it because I was afraid of it. The beautiful thing about that is that I find that if you ever want to get past something that scares you, you kind of have to get closer to it. And so I decided to go in to the Bible instead of stay away from it. And I gave myself a year, but it turned into two years, of Bible study to where I started in the Old Testament. And every section, every chapter I finished, I would read a book by a, an inspirational uh, Christian writer that I was I was fond of, not necessarily even aligned with some of these folks. I didn't see eye to eye on everything, but their interpretations of what I had just read were important to me in that way. You need to publish somehow what you did, because now I'm desperate to do that study. What you read, your 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 extra reading, like the books you read on top of reading the Bible, I feel like need, you need to put that out there somewhere. I mean, I could tell you, so Peter uh, Gnome's The Good Book, Rachel Held, Ever Held Evans, Rob Bell, Velvet Elvis, Love Wins, Sex God, Brennan Manning, All Is Grace, The Signature of Jesus, Regamuffin Gospel, uh, on and on and on. Thank you so much, Brandy. This was so awesome. I'm like, I'm now I'm like writing it frantically down. You should see my writing everywhere. You should see the, thank you for that. I think that's such a cool way to study the Bible. So interesting. Thank you so much. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast, free wherever you get your podcasts. What's about to happen on our plaza is you're all going to get your very first COVID vaccine. I'm excited. She's excited. Three, two, one, check. Yes. Yes. So grateful. Is that close to crying? Here we go. Tonight, the CDC's new outdoor mask guidelines. What change that allowed this new recommendation to be made? If we do nothing, what happens to a city like Houston? You're going to repeat this movie over and over again. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high-profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Killer Role, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high-profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. everybody welcome to today future's looking yeah nice. we're gonna do our part and get vaccinated live a very special naturalization ceremony this is a really inspiring group celebrating earth day let's change the world love it 
your latest novel is being turned into all adults here into a television show. We're working on it. Are you working on it? You're writing it? I'm I'm writing it and we'll see. Um, Apple bought it and so now- That's we're... amazing. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. You know, I I, I think, I don't know, yeah, maybe I'm supposed to- I'm knocking, on, I'm knocking on something because <laughs> I have it right here, a wooden desk. This is Open Book with Jenna Bush Hager, and I'm so happy. I have my friend, Emma Straub. She has her book, All Adults Here. It's out in paperback. Emma, have you ever been asked the question if there's one classic that you haven't read that you feel guilty about? Do you ever hear that as a writer? People ask me that so often, and I think that they expect me to like, you know, sheepishly be like, Moby Dick or whatever. That's exactly what I was thinking. But, but the truth is, no, no, no. I think that I am lucky that there are books that I just haven't had the moment to read yet because that means I get to read them now as a 40 year old and not as like an 18 year old who was maybe assigned it for a class or something. You know, I think that, I think that if we can take shame out of, of reading, we would all be so much happier. But will you read Moby Dick ever? That's the question. Sure, sure. Maybe. You're gonna read Moby Dick? It's entirely possible, Jenna. Okay, I'd like you to email me with the book report. Now, now look, I'm shaming you. I, 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 when you asked that question, Moby Dick was what came to my mind, because I'm like, I'm not, and it's referenced so much, and my oldest daughter was like, well, what's Moby Dick about? And I'm like, hmm, it's about a whale. Uh, it's an epic, you know, but she's like, you haven't read it, have you? And I was like, nope. <laughs> and I'll just go ahead and state it here. I don't think I ever will. And you know what? That's fine too. <laughs> okay. Your dad is a writer. He writes mysteries and suspense horror books. Well, did you read any of your dad's work? As a, as a Were you horrified? <laughs> Were you scared? Um, you know, I, I wish I could explain it. Like, I wish I could... I wish I could go back in time and see it because I remember taking one of my dad's books um, called Coco, which was published, I think, in 1990, which was when I was 10 years old. I remember bringing a, like a little mass market paperback of that to summer camp with me. And this book, I mean, it's like, it is dark. It is pitch black dark. <laughs> I just remember being like, <laughs> in my little bunk, like just happy as a clam. I wanted to see what he did, you know? I wanted to experience it. And um, so yeah, I started reading his books when I was very young. Um, and I, th I mean, I think, I think about this a lot because, you know, obviously I, like my dad, am now a writer with kids. And uh, I think that I, I understood my dad a lot through reading his books. Mm -hmm. not, not because, like, not because they were all personal or, or autobiographical, but just because I could see what he was, I wanted to see what he was thinking about. Um, and I hope that my, that my kids someday will, will have that sort of experience reading my books too. So you love to read. It was part of your everyday. And I think you said something that I think is so true. It was like, and I think this goes with the shame. You have this new blog, which I'm obsessed with, I'm giving it to everybody, called Reading is Magic. And um, and you said that that it was just part of like your DNA. You saw your parents read. You, it wasn't pushed on you in a way that felt like severe and that you said that that's not the way to do it. But was there a book that made you want to write? Well, I think I think the books that, that made me want to write were, were probably the mysteries. Um, like when I was maybe in like, say, say like fourth to sixth grade, like that kind of like you see like scholastic book fair zone, you know, I was reading like Christopher Pike and Lois Duncan and like Nancy Drew and all of those books. So, but <laughs> now will you ever write a mystery? Like, do you have that dark side in you somewhere that could use or not really? Well, you know, it's funny. I mean, so right now I am I'm really close to finishing a draft of a new 
novel. And I mean, I'm at this point now where I don't know if it's any good yet. I don't, you know, it's not, I mean, it's sort of in pieces, um, but it's, it's a, it's time travel. It's a time travel book. And it's, it's a lot about New York City in the 1990s, which is, where, you know, when I was a teenager. And so it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's darker. It's darker than my, than my previous books, but it's, it's still not a heist. It's still just about like love. <laughs> You're like, it's darker, but it's not really. Your latest novel is being turned into all adults here into a television show. We're working on it. Are you working on it? You're writing it? I'm, I'm writing it and we'll see. Um, Apple bought it and so now- That's um, amazing. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. You know, I, I, I think, I don't, maybe I'm, I'm not, supposed to- I'm knocking, on, I'm knocking on something because <laughs> I have it right here, a wooden desk. But now, so you're working on it. Do you have dream um, actors for to play these roles? Oh man, I mean, with, so, you know, Astrid, Astrid is my favorite character to like pretend cast because, you know, she's in her late sixties and I just think about like, all these amazing yes. women, like, like, like Holland Taylor, yes. or like Gorney Weaver or Meryl Streep, or you know, they're just, yes. there's so many women of, of, of that generation who are just perfect. Incredible. And, and who I could watch all day, you yeah. know? I so, was thinking Diane Keaton. I'm not sure why, but I just think she would, right? Any, they would, so so you don't get to actually cast it, do you? No. You're writing it for them. I don't get to do anything. <laughs> what are your favorite books that you would recommend that everybody, and I know, listen, it's not Moby Dick, there's no shame in that, but yeah. what is something you feel like everybody should read before they're, before they die? Okay. Whew. Oh man, that's hard. I know. It's hard. Okay. I, I'll, let me let me think of a few. I guess uh, Middlemarch, George Eliot. That is one. That is a classic that to me is a hundred percent worth every minute you spend reading it. Pride and Prejudice, I would say. Yeah, but but then there. I mean, there are so many. There are so many newer books too. Oh God. I mean, yeah, I, I so, but some of them are silly. You know, I like I'm, like I feel like, you know, if you never read any David Sedaris essays, your life would be just a little bit less funny. You know, the book you picked that that I think I would put on my, like everyone should read it is the Kevin Wilson. Oh, I love that. Nothing, book. nothing to see here. I can't get over that book. I think the reason that it's that it resonates to you know sort of across the like parental line is because it's it's about a woman who sort of finds herself in charge of these kids you know it's not it's not it's not the the story which i am very interested in but not everyone is of of, of a mother who's like oh god he is such a brilliant writer i know well should we just leave it with that all right always a pleasure jenna okay, thank, thank you. you emma bye everybody Right now on NBC News Now. Here in Chicago, about 20,000 middle schoolers returning to school today. They also took advantage of existing vaccine distribution networks throughout Alaska. It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. We're going to do our part and get vaccinated live. A very special naturalization ceremony. This is a really inspiring group. Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! Tonight, the CDC's new outdoor mask guidelines. What change that allowed this new recommendation to be made? If we do nothing, what happens to a city like Houston? You're going to repeat this movie over and over again. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. I joined Ellen on her set, what's been a difficult year for her personally and for her show. Very few people go through such huge public humiliation. How can I be an example of strength and perseverance if I give up and run away? 
Killer Row, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Killer Row, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. It's so important um, to, uh, to, to feel like you are represented out there. You, you don't have to be made fun of. You know, you can have a wonderful life and be, you know, very well off and have a loving home. But if you're not seeing yourself represented, that's a message that, that is sending, that is being sent to you that's saying you don't kind of count. So it's, it's very important. This is Jenna Bush Hager and welcome to Open Book. I'm so excited to have uh, someone I really admire, my friend Tay Diggs with me to talk about his new book, My Friend, which is a book that I think every kid should read. It's so much fun. Tay, when you were young, did you think like, okay, I'm gonna write picture books. Was this something you thought you would do? <laughs> no, no, not at all. Uh, and, and Shane, uh, the, the illustrator and one of my best friends and the, and the kind of co-writer of this book, it was his idea when I was much younger. Uh, I would dabble in, in poetry and he thought that uh, that some of the poetry would make a really good, would make really good children's books. So then we just, uh, we started and, and here we are. I think yeah. there's something really beautiful about a friendship, a partnership that inspires, you know, somebody that 100%. says like we can create together. What 100%. is that? Yeah, yeah what yeah. has that been like? It's been awesome. You know, a lot of people say you never should work with friends and in, in, a, in a lot of a lot of cases that's true. But with us, it's the kind of relationship where we have this shorthand where he's so amazing at what he does and he has this trust with, with what I do that uh, this is like our fourth or fifth book together. Your books have always talked about diversity, Has have always mm -hmm. talked about being enough. How mm -hmm. important is representation? So important in, in all of the Black Lives Matter, with all of that, it's, it's obvious that we're kind of going through that, but it's something that we've we've needed to to realize for quite some time. Growing up, it was something that, that I struggled with. Uh, I have a child that's biracial, and it's something I'm constantly, you know, making sure that he's aware of, and that he is enough, and that regardless of of what other people think, you know, he has that that power within himself to to know that, you know, he's all right. Uh, it doesn't matter how you look or how much money you have or who your friends are. That uh, that 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 kind of power needs to come from within. So yeah, it's a, me a message that is that is very important now and has been and continues to be. Yeah, um, I I just um, have been reading Toni Morrison, and one of the oh, things wow. she said is that you know when she was younger and she was a reader, an avid mm -hmm. reader, you know some of the books that were assigned to her in school didn't show anybody that looked like her. You know there was yeah. nothing that resembled her life in the pages of what she read. Mm -hmm. What about when you were young? Did you did you find yourself in books, and and what books moved you? My family growing up, everybody we would buy each other greeting cards. And in the greeting cards, it was very rarely that they, they, there were the characters in the greeting cards looked like me. So my father would color in the, uh, the, the characters in the greeting cards so that they look chocolate. And that's where the, the term chocolate meat comes from. So to answer your question, no, there were not a lot of books that had characters that looked like me. My mother scoured the earth uh, uh, to find them. Um, there was a book named Corduroy where they had a little black girl who finds this little uh, bear that has a missing button. And she, you know, she, nobody wants to buy the bear because it's got a missing button. She buys the bear and, and the bear is home. Um, that was a great book. Uh, uh, and then there was uh, a book called Snowy Day about a little, a little brother that uh, enjoys the snow. So the books were few and far between. It's changed. Uh, we still need to, to, to do better, but it's, it's, it's a lot better right now. And, uh, and Shane and I, we feel so lucky to be, just to be a part of that. What about your son is now, I think probably reading to himself, but. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> he is, he is. Do y'all talk about books and do you remember reading to him as a little, as a little boy? He loves to read. So, you know, that, that was awesome. So it's great that he get, he actually, the, 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 the last thing that I, that I read, that I wrote, I asked him to kind of proofread for me and uh, and I got his stamp of approval, so it's it's been great. And he's he's 11 now, so we can actually have real discussions, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's been really really cool. You said, and I, I read in an interview, which I think a lot of people can relate to, that mm -hmm. books were a made were your best friends before you had siblings. 
Sure, Thank sure. You. Yeah, Do you was, still uh, find solace in reading? It helped me become uh, an actor, you know what I mean? Just the, the idea of being able to escape uh, whatever was going on in my life, um, as dramatic as it sounds. I could read and that immediately became my life. So um, books are way, way more important than, than, uh, than, than I kind of uh, sometimes uh, take the time to realize. Is there one to start off this new year? Is there one book you would recommend to everybody besides my friend? <laughs> People are gonna get so mad. But Chelsea Handler, I've been reading a lot of Chelsea Handler <laughs> and David Sedaris. Um, those, those, those are the last two. Listen, I love Chelsea Handler. She's one of my favorites. What about the most, the most impactful? Let's end with that. Something that, that both oh. Probably the autobiography of Malcolm X. Yeah, my professors are looking down and smiling on me. Yeah, that <laughs> one. Yeah, that was that was probably the most impactful. Where, as a young man growing up, realized, oh, the world the world is is this way as opposed to that way. Yeah. Today all day we've got a great show for you on this Friday morning. Let's kick it off with Pop Start. Carson has the latest pop culture news we all need to know. Take a look. Time for the best time of the morning. Yes, it is. Oh yes, yeah. Carson Daly. Is the graphics department up? He fired it up, I believe. Who's in today? <laughs> yeah. Yep, we got the graphics department up. Jackson's here, ready to go. We got <laughs> a little over three minutes so. and a lot to get to. So let's let's jump right in. I got to get the kid to school. Nicole Kidman <laughs> kicks off Pop Start today. The Academy Award-winning actress recently sat down with funny man Chris Rock for Variety's latest edition of Actors on Actors. Nicole opening up about what it means to her to take on her latest role playing TV icon Lucille Ball in an upcoming biopic about her life and revealing how she rarely gets cast in roles similar to the I Love Lucy star. I love to be funny. I'm, oh, you I'm, be always, funny. I'm never cast funny. I'd like to be funny. Okay. Well, you're playing Lucille Ball. You're be funny, but the strange thing about Lucille Ball is that everyone thinks we're remaking the I Love Lucy show, and it is so Ooh. not that. It's it's about Luce, Lucille and Desi and their relationship and their marriage. It's very deep, actually. Yeah, they had a very complicated marriage. Yeah. And Nicole is currently in the midst of shooting that movie where she'll star alongside Javier Bardem playing mm -hmm. the role of Lucy's longtime business partner and ex-husband Desi Arnaz. That is some great casting right there. Next up, Bruce Springsteen. Although most shows aren't expected to come back to Broadway until September, Springsteen announced earlier this week that he would be returning to hit the stage for a limited return of his hit show, kicking off in just a few weeks. Springsteen on Broadway ended its original run back in December of 2018. The show, if you haven't seen it, it's great. It's a mix of Springsteen performing his greatest hits and then also sharing some personal stories from his decades-long career. Yesterday, the boss called into Sirius XM's E Street Radio to share how he's preparing for the upcoming performances. Are you, are you rehearsing right now? Or did, are you, you know, did you pull out the script? Or you know, how did this... <laughs> where are you now with, with all of this? Because this is coming up soon, well, June 26th. I, I, I have the script. I haven't looked at it. And I haven't done any rehearsing, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like they're going to be in for quite yeah, the show. Script. <laughs> Just hasn't looked at it yet, but that's a start. <laughs> Springsteen on Broadway begins its summer run June 26th at the St. James Theater. Great spot right here in New York. And by the way, we're going to have an interview with Bruce and the Killers uh, next week as they give us an exclusive first look at their new collaboration. Cool. Next up, In the Heights. We talked about it a lot this week ahead of the official premiere of the highly anticipated musical based on Lin-Manuel Miranda's popular Broadway show. The film hit the big screen Wednesday night to kick off the 20th annual Tribeca Festival. Stars were walking the red carpet at the opening night of the 12 day long event here in New York celebrating film and new media. And since the movie's wide release in theaters around the country beginning just yesterday, it's already reaching some pretty great heights, earning a 95% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, along with its theatrical release, In the Heights is currently streaming on HBO Max. Be a lot of people watching that this weekend. And finally, our buddy Wolfgang Van Halen, the rocker son of the late great Eddie Van Halen and our pal Valerie Bertinelli, is out today with some excellent brand new music. Overnight, he released the debut title from his solo band, Mammoth WVH. Now, you might be asking, what is a solo band? 
Well, that's because Wolf plays literally every instrument. He sings every single vocal on the record himself. But don't worry, he will be bringing a band with him this summer when he hits the road and tours, and he's opening for Guns N' Roses. You can hear him talk all about it on his first episode of his new monthly Sirius XM show that kicks off today on their classic Rewind channel. Love Wolfie. The stuff is so great. Good. Happy for him. And of course, shout out to Valerie. We love you. And that is your pop start for the weekend, guys. All Have right. a good one. Carson, That's thank it. you. Have a great day at school, Jack. Thank you as well. And guys, I believe we have just enough time left in this half hour to celebrate birthdays. Ow. There you go. Let's bring it on. Spin those Smucker's jars. First up, let's wish a happy 100th birthday to Donna, Donna Jeffrey. She is a chocolate lover from Dearborn Heights, Michigan. She says the secret to longevity, just keep moving. That's good advice. Ther uh, Theresa, Theresa Mermelstein of Belmore, New York, also 100. She can make anybody feel better with her chicken soup recipe. Happy 100th birthday to Lola Mendez Enriquez of Newark, New Jersey. If she's not out shopping, you're going to catch Lola hanging with the grandkids, and I love that hat. Frank Pugliano is from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, this World War II vet celebrating 100 years. Frank still cuts his own grass on a tractor every week, and we salute you for your service, sir. John Lorenz of Cromwell, Connecticut, 100, a retired New York City firefighter on a New York's Bravest. Thank you for everything you've done, sir. And happy 104th birthday to Justine Wexner, a selfless lady from Chicago, Illinois. For years, Justine didn't know if she was born in 1917 or 1918 until the family tracked down the birth certificate. So now we can confidently say happy 104th birthday, Justine. That's a very 104. I love it. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring is sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! Tonight, the CDC's new outdoor mask guidelines. What change that allowed this new recommendation to be made? If we do nothing, what happens to a city like Houston? You're going to repeat this movie over and over again. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Right now on NBC News Now. They've done things like installing cameras to help alert Border Patrol to people crossing. They are escaping a number of conditions there, uh, violence and persecution in their home countries. Welcome back. Today in the third hour, Craig has an incredible story of kindness, resilience, and an unshakable bond. Take a look. We always love to bring you some upside on a Friday morning. This next story shows how powerful a small gesture can be. That's all it took to bring two strangers together and change both of their lives forever. The problem is we don't open our hearts because we're scared. My advice is don't be scared. In 2019, Scott Kuzmarski was recently retired and determined to use his time for good. You're out in California, you were visiting your son, and then what? I said, okay, I'm gonna go out there and do something I would never do and engage the homeless people. In my mind, I was gonna hand out water and look people in the eyes and acknowledge their existence, but Robert and I connected at a level I didn't expect. When Scott first spotted Robert Pineda, Robert had been living on the street for almost 30 years. What struck me is this guy on a bike with every single thing he owns on it. I'm walking my dog with a frown on my face because my coffee's cold, and he's got a big smile on his face. And I'm going, what the heck is wrong with me? Scott felt a special connection right away. But after decades of being on his own, Robert took some time to open up. How did he approach you? He was walking his dog, and he offered me to buy me a croissant. 
and a, and a cup of coffee. And tell him what you told me your name was at the time. And I actually told him my name was Jack. I didn't grow to trust people right away at the time, you know. But uh, I certainly learned that Scott was a good guy. Soon, the two were having breakfast together every day. I got to know the man, and I was like, man, this guy is me. Even though he looks so different, it just amazed me that under the surface, a little bit, we're identical almost. I thought he's like, we're identical twins. I see it. I see, I see the resemblance. It's striking. It's striking. <laughs> Scott quickly realized that, like him, Robert might benefit from mental health care. But he knew gaining Robert's trust, and more importantly, getting him to a doctor, would be difficult. I'm a little nervous. So he came up with a plan. What better way than to go out there and, and show him that I can live like he can live and then show him the other side of the coin with myself. I tell you, you don't need more than a day out there to realize how invisible you become. Robert, what did you think when, when Scott decided to spend the night on the street with you? Well, I thought he was joking at first. <laughs> Why would you have to come down here with me? I'm dirt poor. <laughs> The plan worked. Scott had gained his trust, and Robert agreed to visit a local service center where he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Robert, what changes did you notice after you started taking medication? I noticed a, a lot clearer, more focus. I slowly started trusting, I think, a little bit more people. With Robert's treatment figured out, Scott went back to the East Coast and decided there was one more thing he could do for his new friend. Scott offered to start looking for some real estate. And that's where it really threw me off. I thought, he's going to buy a house, maybe? You know? <laughs> this is, this is, this just does not happen. Scott looked all over the country for a new home for Robert before setting on a cabin in Rhode Island, just a few miles from where Scott and his family live. My favorite part is he lets me pretend I'm like a rough woodsman because he's a carpenter and we got this cabin, so I'm sitting there faking like I know what a hammer stuff. By May of 2020, less than a year after he met Scott, Robert was a homeowner, and the two men had forged an unshakable bond. He accepts situations, he accepts people, he, he gives me such good advice when I'm starting to get mad at something, and he says, boom, and he gives me their perspective immediately. He was my only infrastructure to any kind of communication for the love of god it was it was a blessing wow oh can you imagine i mean he just he happens upon this homeless man on the west coast and then a year and some change later he's helped him buy a house and he had him and he got him treatment so, yes. that, so that he can think and think yes. clearly yeah that's amazing I, you know, you know god's got a plan yes wow uh, i mean it's you know i, I one the, something else i took away from the story is you know it it, it, it pays off to pay attention to those around you. Robert's doing well. He's got a treatment plan now. And uh, I said to him after the interview, I said, I hope somebody's got the movie rights to this. Mm, that's true. Wow. It'll be well, a great film. Thanks fantastic. for sharing that. That yeah. was exactly what we needed that's today. Good. Coming up on Hoda and Jenna, Willie returns to co-host. Stay with us. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring is from, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. <laughs> Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! Ready actors. An indie horror film, a talented young actress, and a deadly shot. Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Role. Action! Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. Right now on NBC News Now. Here in Chicago, about 20,000 middle schoolers returning to school today. They also took advantage of existing vaccine distribution networks throughout Alaska. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Our across America journey, Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky. Cleveland. 
reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Welcome back. Today on Hoda and Jenna, Willie fills in for Hoda, and you can play along with one of our favorite games, Donnarama. Take a look. All right, you're right. I was supposed to be in Washington, D.C. right now, jumping out of an airplane. I know. I jumped the gun a little bit because I had this visual of you strapped in on that plane and just going. I've never gone skydiving. Would you You've ever do it? it? I would, definitely. I definitely would do it. Why won't you come with me? I was looking well, I wasn't for a companion. Invited. Can you imagine the two of us <laughs> strapped together? <laughs> Cross your fingers and jump. Um, One thing that happens, too, is that your cheeks start yes. kind of blowing in right. the wind, right. which is a really horrible visual. But sadly, <laughs> the weather was not cooperating, so it looks like our mission has been grounded for now, but I'm pretty sure... It's happening next week, so cross your fingers. Okay, I cannot wait. Does that mean I have to come with you now that I've been given some notice? Did you say you would really do it? I mean, I don't know. I think you should be with a professional. You don't want no, me with you. No, but I know, but you. you could jump with me with a professional and you're back. What day is that? <laughs> so I've like, got a no Zoom meeting I've got to do that day. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of, like, what my code word is going to be. What does that mean? Meaning I just don't want to say, <laughs> no, that doesn't mean anything weird. No, no. no I just want to make sure I don't say a word that has to be bleeped out. Do you know what I mean? Right, so right, So I right. need to think of the word for something else. Do you know what I'm saying? Right, but there's no code word to say, like, abort the mission or no, no, cut no. me loose or something. It's happening. Okay, okay, this but is But the happening. one thing, I did it when I was 18, yeah. and it is so much fun and so exhilarating. I mean, 18-year-old Jenna is very different <laughs> than 38, 39-year-old Jenna. Because Jenna has a few more responsibilities yes. in her life. Yes, yeah. like a mortgage and, yeah. I don't know, kids. children. You also have kids. I have yeah. three of them. Yeah. So when I was jumping the last time, the guy was like, okay, you know, pull your cord. I'm like, well, how will I remember to pull your cord? He's like, most people don't forget to pull their cord. <laughs> Towards the end, the man himself said, well, now I'm going to pull your cord. Oh, you didn't pull I, it? I was just having so much right. fun. You're locked in. I forgot about the, the requirement. And does the guy say time to pull the cord? or is He just, he just pulled it for me. He just did it. Yes. Okay. Well, we've been so excited because we've gotten some advice from people who've done it before. So today we have a message from a fellow Texan, Brittany Smith. So my advice to you is to pretend like you are super excited, like you're about to have a thrill of your life, even though you are scared and nervous. If you smile through it, it definitely makes it better. Oh, and make sure you use the restroom before you go. Oh, now that's the tip of the week. Use the restroom before you go. I would hate it if I, the poor fellow jumping with me got a horrible surprise. Oh um, okay, that's thank you, advice. Brittany. Wow. Well, you're also, let's just say, you're doing this for a great cause, yes. for a great reason, yes. and so cool that it's your around your grandfather's birthday, who it's, was doing this till he was 90 years old. Yeah, there's this incredible new music museum that just reopened the army the united states yeah. army museum and i can't wait to do it all right willie loves games i, I love, love games. games and since it's friday we are going to play one of our favorite games it's called donna rama right, donna. donna willie welcome to donna rama we're so happy to have you today now before we get to the game let's find out who you're playing for this is this is a big moment spinning this wheel we're going to find out who we'll be playing for Team Willie is LaToya Jones from Jacksonville, Florida. And on Team Jenna is Ida Dale from Jacksonville, Go North Ida. Carolina. Go Jacksonville. Ida. Go LaToya. Okay. Okay. Now, the theme this week is related or relationships. Okay. So here's how it goes. We'll show you a picture of two people, and you just guess if you think they're related or in a relationship. Okay. All of these photos are either viewer or staff submitted. Willie, as our guest of honor, you get to go up first. Okay. Are you... Do okay. you ever think you're one of the most bizarre game people? Yeah, did you ever think you'd be going. playing it? So you have to decide if the people are brother and sister or if they are dating. Oh, they're, my God. There's are they really, there's no, no, there's no rhyme just or reason to this. It's okay. just your gut. Okay, just follow your gut. Okay, okay. so first Ready. up, Willie. Yeah. Here is Rachel and Tim from New York, New York. I, uh, Do you think that they are related or in a relationship? I think they're in a relationship. That's you a are nice right. cheek to cheek. Yeah, yeah I think you're right. Cheek to cheek. cheek, to cheek. cheek to just yeah. hit their body yes. language. Okay. They met in college and have been together for two and a half years. Okay. Good job, eh? Cool. All right. Okay, Jenna, Kathy and David from Sarasota, Florida. Nope. You know what? There's that space. I believe that they are brother and sister. They, uh, you know what? Oh. They have actually been married for 32 years. Oh. 
Wow. Okay. 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 I'm All right. Come Willie. back from this. Okay. Jesse and Chad from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. That is relationship 100%. That is 100% related. Uh. <laughs> See, things, like, no, things get, get a little close. bit awkward here on Donnarama, but it all works out in this the This is very awkward, but okay. Okay, Jenna, Hannah and Matt from New York, New York. Okay, I think that they're in a relationship. Yeah. You are correct. Okay, good. They I'm coming college, back. Here we go. One together to for one. three and a half years. Right. Okay. One awkward. to one. Okay. Oh, Willie, you'll know this. This is our chat producer, Reka and oh, Nunes oh, from New York, New York. that's a relationship. Yes, it is. Yes, they it just is. got married, that. and I have permission to say they're expecting. I know, hey, Reka. Hey, congratulations, Reka. I didn't know that. Congratulations to Reka and Nunes. Did you know the two of them? Well, I knew she was in a relationship, so I assumed she was. Just assumed. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I knew they were in a relationship. That's unfair. Okay, okay. Jenna, you're, it's one to two. Okay, here we go. Taylor and Tristan from Merrick, New York. I think that they are related. You're right. You knew that it too. Was, yeah. yeah. That's a wow. nice. There's something nice about it. He there. seems a little younger. Okay. okay. Brother, sister. All right. Here's the tiebreaker. Jasmine and Sean from Auburn, Alabama. Willie. Um, that's a brother and sister. That is a relationship. Oh, I would have said. I would have said related too. It looks like they're at the Kroger and they just went <laughs> shopping. I don't know. All right, well, Family so who well, won? Jenna won? No, no, it's not over yet. Well, it's tied. And There's not an extra, wait, no, no, but. That was the tiebreaker and I lost, so I think Jenna wins. No, we're tied. Since you guys tied, guess what? The folks at Gap are sending a $300 gift card to both LaToya and Ida, so it pays to be good. If you want to play along with Donnarama, head to hodenjenna.com and hit the connect button and make sure you watch every Friday to see if you've been chosen. That was weird but fun. <laughs> I like any game, but that one, it turns that out one really pushed actually, it. Actually, any game works, right? Because yes. that one was That's odd. Donna's hosted. Exactly. She's a master of it. If you need a good laugh, there's a great movie you can watch this weekend. It's called Queen Bee. It looks good. It's got an incredible cast. Jane Curtin, Ellen Burstyn, Anne Margaret, Loretta Devine, and James Caan, just to name a few. And Donna got a chance to sit down with three of those legends. I sure did. It was amazing. And let me just say, we laughed a lot. This movie is about love and friendship, which is something everyone can relate to, no matter your age. Take a look. This table is by invitation only. Are you serious? It's Golden Girls meets Mean Girls. We don't take crap from anyone. Starring Ellen Burstyn, one of few to achieve the triple crown of acting. They're like Mean Girls, but with medical alert bracelets. Golden Globe and Emmy Award winning Anne Margaret. We are the cool ones. And NAACP Image and Emmy Award winning Loretta Devine. She used to say serious as a heart attack, but then Marjorie killed over, so she don't say it anymore. Queen Bees is based on a real-life love story that blossomed in a retired living community. I think this is called stalking. Ellen, your character reluctantly ends up in a retired living community. Do you know what? There was a lot of romance going on in that place. Didn't yes. you think so? There's a lot of couples forming. You always walk around at night with a bottle of wine. Budding romance wasn't the only resemblance between the halls of the senior facility and the halls of a high school. There were hints to Mean Girls, the movie. Have any of you guys seen Mean Girls? Yes, yes. No, Ellen, you haven't seen them. No. I don't see movies with the word mean in. <laughs> I have this line that says, High school, we graduate. Here we die. And so I think it sort of like turned out that that became what it was about, you know. No matter where you are, there are always clicks. Loretta, you said you liked playing mean. Is that right? <laughs> I rarely get to be to play mean, and then my character turned out not to be mean, really. The Queen Bees may start off as total bees, but watching the film, you can't help but fall in love with them. This movie makes you laugh, it makes you cry. What Yay! It makes you feel all the feels. What has it taught you about love and friendship? So there was lots of times, but Anne Margaret and I went shopping a couple of times together. So. Meeting new people and starting new friendships, it, it, that happened in the film a lot. Did this movie restore anything for you all? Well, <laughs> our careers. <laughs> <laughs> My faith in friendship, uh, I love the idea 
that we have all the our older friends that we've had forever and then you meet a great new group of friends and all of a sudden you've got thousands <laughs> oh, no it I had the best time doing this movie. I'm so happy that this movie is going to be showing in theaters because I think it's more enjoyable to see a comedy with a lot of other people. Well, the one thing I can say about this movie, it leaves everybody with such a warm feeling. They're right. sort of like seeing into the, what their lives are like and what they can look forward to if they live, you know? So that's... <laughs> yeah, the living is important. <laughs> <laughs> your, your life... Life doesn't stop at a certain age. Right. I think this movie really shows that. Just be open. You've got to be open to new friends and new situations. Really quickly, we have a Hoda and Jenna quick quiz. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, what is one item that's always in your purse? Lipstick. Money. <laughs> Credit card. What is the most starstruck you've ever been? I live next door to Barishnikov. I had a, a teepee on my property, and we used to go in there and light fires and serve him champagne. It was my, one of my favorite things I've ever done in my life. <laughs> and what is the best life advice you've ever received? Uh, don't let anyone hurt you. Mm. No good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> and also, above all, be kind. <laughs> Yes. And that is exactly what your characters did. That is exactly what you've done today. There's a bond that we created that's real. Yes. And the movie makes it forever. That's what's so great about it. I mean, it'll outlive us all, won't it? <laughs> that's right. It's a great film. Queen Bees hits theaters nationwide. That's exciting to say. Yes. And is on demand today. Oh, it looks so, so good. Good job, Donna. What a great cast. Thanks so much, Donna. Today Talks continues after the break. Morning, welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Alice in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high-profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Ready, actors. An indie horror film, a talented young actress, and a deadly shot. Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Role. Action! Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. So back to this Easter suit. <laughs> okay, something to address. I didn't wear this suit on Easter. Listen, well, Easter missed out. Because <laughs> here's the thing. You guys have both upped your, upped your fashion games this morning. I kid you not, I turned on the TV this morning downstairs in my dressing room, and I was like, <laughs> So what happened? So Rooker last week, he wore a seersucker suit on television. Yes. I was like, wow. Yeah. I didn't know we could do that. So I'm going to go buy me one. No, I had one in my closet. Yeah. I just had this. Oh, you were like, ooh. I was like, well, if I wore it, I could wear mine. I did not know he was going to show up today and then, new sport. And then Al, Al decided, I'm like, and then I'm like, dang, I don't have anything solid in my closet, because otherwise. People are turning on right now trying to adjust their TVs. Oh, so Forget sorry. it. So here's the thing. We posted a poll on our Twitter page. It's our Friday fashion face-off. Wow. <laughs> Who's Jack? are you feeling more? Av, owl looking bad in plaid? <laughs> or, that? oh, no. <laughs> what the prompter says, or are you a serious sucker for Craig's dreamy, creamy suit? Our, our writers this morning, are, are really, they're taking it up to another level. Wow, 85 right. people have voted already. 85 people Look at just that. put it up. A lot of folks so just make Craig on, in the lead. It's very, yeah. This is not for everybody. No. Trust what, is the, what does the, the winner get? Do we get 
The winner gets a gift on Father's Day. Okay, okay. you're gonna give us a gift? A personalized gift. Okay. Wow. Yes. All right, well, now I'm in. At Third Hour today to vote on Twitter, and we'll share the results a little later in the show. Before we go, we want to update you on our fashion face-off. Al and Craig both went head-to-head -head with their bold jacket choices this morning. Here are the results so far. Craig has a big lead on you, Al. Not too big. No, but no, no, he looks good. 57.9. He's he rocking the seer sucker. There you go. Welcome to Today All Day. All Day? Today All Day. All Day. This is a long oh, way of man. asking, yeah. who's your favorite okay. character you've ever oh, played? The right. unicorn. The unicorn. You gotta have the unicorn. <laughs> What is she right there? That's why you're saying all these nice things? Yeah, she gave me the, the look. Sorry to disturb your day. Everyone's mad at you, Willie. Better make this fast. I don't want the wrath of Luna. When I see you, I always think, I wonder what his quote would be. Give us six minutes and we'll ask as many questions as we can. Welcome to Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Hi, buddy Cal. Cooking with me. Dad's no babysit. It's called parenting. What was the first book you remember loving? Heart Smart today with simple exercises to strengthen your heart. Make the most of your beach days. It's all about the tracksuit now. How wow. good do they look? I now pronounce you husband and wife. Kiss the bride. This morning, a story of people helping people. You've received tons of letters from people who have been inspired. Let's do the weather out. <laughs> OK. All you got to do is say, it's cold, it's warm, it's raining, it's snowing. That's it. One of our most favorite yes. franchises ever, wow. Ambush Makeovers. Okay. Look at it. It doesn't, it doesn't look so good. No, it doesn't look good. Will you okay. judge us in a cook-off? I yes. will, and okay. you guys will definitely Hey, Willie, it's good to see you. Thank you. It's good to be seen. <laughs> so let's let's talk about that album, That's Life. I didn't fully appreciate what a big fan of Frank Sinatra you were and always have been since you were a young man. <clears throat> what was it about Frank when you were young that so caught your ear down in Texas? Well, his choice of songs, first of all, uh, he could pick them, you know. I, I don't know if he was a writer or not, but I know he could really uh, go into a session and he, I knew he'd have 10 good songs and uh, he never let me down, you know, uh, practically everything that he's recorded, I've loved it. So naturally I'm a huge Sinatra fan. And you talk a lot about Willie, his phrasing. And I think people who aren't in your line of work don't fully understand quite what that means. What does it mean to have great phrasing the way Frank did? Well, that was another thing that I liked about Frank was his phrasing. Uh, he never did the same song twice the same way. He did it the way he felt it, and each way he felt it a little bit different than he did the time before. But that's cool. I, that's what I loved about it. And that's unique, isn't it? I mean, most people want to stay on the beat, and he was ahead of it sometimes and behind it other times, and he didn't mind that. Yeah, I love that. I love to be able to play with the beat. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, you screw up sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Beautifully, though. Beautifully screwed yeah, up. You try to cover it up. That's right. That's right. So what compelled you then to start covering some of his songs? You had an album out a couple of years ago that won you a Grammy. And now this is another effort covering some of Frank's songs. What made you think, I love the guy so much that I'm going to do one of his albums? Well, <clears throat> the first... Uh, album that I, I did of Sinatra's because was because I love him so much <clears throat> and we had so much success with that one that uh, I said why not let's do another one because there's a uh, hundred other great songs out there. Is Cottage there any... for Sale. Uh, yeah. Cottage for Sale to me is one of the most beautiful songs I've ever heard. Hmm. Is there a challenge to reproducing songs that people love so much? Do you ever wonder Boy, people love the way Frank did it. I'm not sure how they'll feel about the way I sing it. Well, you have to believe that your fans at least will like the way you're doing it. Uh, I don't think anybody expected me to sound like Frank. Uh, and <laughs> even though I was good, I, I, just, I don't have that good a voice. Well, you, it's beautiful. I was listening to it last night and this morning. It's just a beautiful album. He'd be so proud of you. Do you um, did you have much of a relationship with Frank? I know you looked up to him when you were young. Did you get to know him a little bit? Yeah, I did. We played some shows together. Uh, we played a show, I think, Vegas and Reno and different places. And 
one of my greatest regrets, I was telling somebody a while ago, is that one night we played a show in Vegas and he invited me by his place to hang out and I couldn't. I had to get on a bus and go to L.A. And I always regretted that I didn't get to hang out with Frank. I mean, not many people would pass up the opportunity to hang with Sinatra in Vegas. <laughs> yeah. And it stays with you, doesn't it? Well, he's um he's got he's such a unique character. Did you once you got to know him, what was he like to be around? Well, he's a lot of fun. He was, you know, he'd tell a few jokes and uh he was great, you know. It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything for traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Our week-long journey begins here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. In Cleveland. Our Across America journey, reporting on an America rebuilding and reimagining a future after the pandemic. Breaking news tonight, the ceasefire in the Middle East after 11 days of deadly violence. Richard Engel is on the ground. Do you think there's a connection between policing and racism? How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. You guys did, I was just telling you before we started, you did some um, videos together for NASA, which I was watching earlier. And it's Frank in his tuxedo and you and your headband and your and your pigtails. And it was just two guys who didn't like look like they ought to be together, but it worked perfectly. You guys had some fun, didn't you? Yeah, that was, I remember doing that. Uh, I think Reagan was in that some way too. I remember him being in there. Uh, yeah, it was back in the 80s. You That's know, I love doing Sinatra songs and, uh, you know, I probably won't do another album, but I'm sure glad that I got to do two, you know. And Willie, how do you pick the songs that you'll put on an album? Because as you say, there are just so many to choose from with him. It wasn't hard at all. I just kind of, uh, I said, yeah, I caught it for sale. Yeah, we'll do that one. We'll do this one. We'll do that one. It was a no brainer, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's uh, he um, in some ways he is an icon in the way that you are an icon. Is that a strange thing for you to think about that there are young artists out there who want to grow up to be Willie Nelson or would love to someday play a bunch of your songs on an album? I need to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they need some advice. <laughs> What does that term mean to you? Legend. Willie Nelson, he's a legend. What does that mean to you? I thought it was a legend. I wasn't sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm so big words always throw me. Yeah, legend, icon, all those things. I bet they do. I bet they do. Um, I'm just I'm so interested that growing up in that little town in, in Texas, in Abbott, Texas, about your musical taste that brought you to Frank Sinatra. What kind, I know you grew up singing in the church and Amazing Grace was probably your first song. Who are your other influences at that young age, Willie? Well, Hank Williams, uh, Bob Wills, Ted Death and Floyd Tillman, just so many of the old, old time guys that I knew and Leon Payne, uh, a blind singer from Texas. He had a great song called I Love You Because. But I don't know. I just uh, love all those old songs. And I never get tired of hearing them. And I never get tired of singing them. Were there a lot of people listening to Sinatra in Abbott, Texas? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. He was popular everywhere. Yeah, he was. He was. Everybody knew Frank. 
But I imagine you grew up based on the names that you just listed, Willie, that you, you wanted to grow up to be a cowboy. You wanted to be a country singer. And Frank was something a little different. So how did you use his influences in your own career? Well, uh, you know, I also like Gene Archery and Roy Rogers and, uh, you know, the cowboys. And so I kind of mixed it all together. Uh, but I was glad that I got to know Sinatra and Gene Archery. That's a pretty cool life, if you can say that, both yeah. of them, huh? <laughs> Do you remember, Willie, the first song you wrote back when you were, I guess, seven years old with your new guitar? Or do you remember playing in front of a crowd for the first time? I remember the first poem. I was about five years old, six years old. And uh, they introduced me to do something. And uh, my poem was, what are you looking at me for? I ain't got nothing to say. If you don't like the looks of me, look the other way. <laughs> You're five years old with that attitude, Willie? Yeah. <laughs> and you never I really on, changed. I had, little, I had on a little white sailor suit with, you know, red trimmings. And I got nervous doing my poem. I started picking my nose. <laughs> and so I started, my nose started bleeding all over my little oh. sailor suit. And what are you looking at me for? <laughs> <laughs> that one will stay with you. That moment will it stay did. with you for a long time. So you, you come up playing that music, Willie, and then I guess around 1960, you decide it's time to go to Nashville. Uh, what was it like once you got to town there? To Nashville? Yeah, yeah, because I, you know, it's funny, Willie, I was looking at old pictures of you. We know, we think we know what Willie Nelson looks like, but when you first got there, you looked like you could have been in the Beatles or something like that, or the Beach Boys. <laughs> well, and I, I got into the hog business up there in Nashville, too, you know. I, I raised hogs for a long time and uh, uh, wore my overalls a lot. So. <laughs> <laughs> I've got an album cover with me with overalls. On. I weighed about, you know, 180 pounds. <laughs> so it was healthy up there in Ridgetop, Tennessee. Yeah, yeah. And professionally, as you kind of tried to find your way, you weren't originally the outlaw country, as people have called you since then, were you? Not really. I really didn't. Uh, I didn't consider myself being, you know, because I liked all the old country guys, Ray Price and, you know, Roy Acuff and Hank Williams. I loved all those guys. Uh, but I left, honestly, I left Nashville and come down to Texas because this was where all my jobs were. The, you know, the broken spoke and the, the different uh, John T. Floors, all the clubs around Texas that I grew up playing. Uh, there wasn't that many, many places to play in Nashville. So, hmm. and I was on the Grand Ole Opry. And in order to say you're a member of the Grand Ole Opry, you have to play it uh, 26 weeks out of the year. Hmm. So a lot of times I'd be in down here in Austin or somewhere on Friday night, and it would be hard for me to get back on Saturday night to do the, the Grand Ole Opry. So it's just a matter of long logistics and I just couldn't do it. I had to choose and I wasn't, I was making a little money down here in the clubs. So uh, <laughs> that brought me on down. I bet. I bet. You got to go where the go where the money is. And when did you feel, Willie, like you sort of um, you made it? It's a cliche that you'd broken through and that people were starting to listen to your music and maybe starting to buy your music. And you weren't just playing small clubs in Texas. Honestly, the first time I thought I had made it. I had been picking cotton and baling hay and working in corn shellers up there in Abbott, and I had uh, got a job playing guitar. I was 12 years old, and I got a job playing rhythm guitar in a Bohemian polka band down in West, which was six miles south of Abbott at the SPJST Hall down there, and I made $8. 
I said, what the hey, man? You know, <laughs> I didn't like this much picking cotton all week. So I found me another way to go. So that, that was my first paying gig. And that was the moment you realized, oh, maybe I could make a living doing this? There you go. And here you are, still making a living doing it every every day. Did you, um, I, I wonder, Willie, if you, when you go out and play all these wonderful songs that you've written over the years, is there one that feels most special to you or more special than the others? Well, I do a medley sometimes of uh, three songs that I wrote that kind of my favorites, uh, Funny How Time Slips Away, Crazy, mm. and Nightlife. And I, I, you know, I do those in a medley on my show. So uh, I, those three songs have really been good for me. Yeah, I bet. Well, I, I'm glad you mentioned Crazy because I'm not sure everybody, casual fan, knows that you wrote Crazy and that Patsy Cline obviously recorded it famously. But that is a Willie Nelson song. Did you write that for Patsy? Did you have her in mind when you wrote it? No. Uh, I had uh, already had it written when I came to Nashville. And uh, I was hanging out in a place called Tootsie's Orchid Lounge. Do you ever hear sure. of that place? I've been, yes. And, and uh, I ran into a guy. Uh, his name was Charlie Dick, and he happened to be Patsy Cline's husband. And we were in Tootsie's and drinking a little beer, you know. And I had brought a, a 45 up and put it on Tootsie's jukebox of me singing crazy. And he heard it and he said, you got to do that for Patsy. And I said, well, it's already after midnight. He said, don't matter. Come on. So we went over to Patsy's house that night to his house and Patsy's. And uh, I said, I ain't getting out. He, so he went in and Patsy come out and made me get out and go in. And I sang the song for her and she recorded it that week. It was and it that was quick. Wow. All time uh, jukebox favorite. I think that's still true, Willie. I think it's the most played song in the history of the jukebox. Yeah. That's amazing. That's an amazing story. So, so was that the kind of song as you write them that you might want to keep for yourself? and not surrender because it's such a good song? No, I was writing for everybody, you know. Uh, one of the first songs I wrote was Family Bible. Mm. I sold it for $50 and uh, watched it go up to number one. Claude Gray <laughs> recorded it. <laughs> and I watched it go to number one. I said, oh God. <laughs> maybe, maybe you learned your lesson with that one then. <laughs> I did, I did. Right now on NBC News Now, They've done things like installing cameras to help alert Border Patrol to people crossing. They are escaping a number of conditions there, of uh, violence and persecution in their home countries. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So. It's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Our week-long journey begins here in Orlando. Louisville, Kentucky. In Cleveland. Our Across America journey, reporting on an America rebuilding and reimagining a future after the pandemic. Breaking news tonight, the ceasefire in the Middle East after 11 days of deadly violence. Richard Engel is on the ground. Do you think there's a connection between policing and racism? How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Our Across America journey here in Louisville, Kentucky. Cleveland reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Ready actors. An indie horror film, a talented young actress, and a deadly shot. Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Role. Action! Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, 
download the NBC News app. What do you make of, Willie, of the way music is sold and distributed today as we talk of the business side of it? You know, people just cutting singles, putting them up on iTunes. How, how has the business changed that way over the years? Well, I, you know, I leave it up to anybody to, you know, to sell them any way he can, I guess. Uh, but for me, uh, I like the old common way of making an album or a CD and selling it or selling it that night on the show and try to make enough gas money to get to the next <laughs> show. So that's the, the way we did it. Yeah. And do you st- is your process the same? You're talking about writing all these songs during our year at home. Is the process basically the same as when you started back with crazy and songs like that, where you just sit down with a guitar with trigger and a piece of paper and figure it out? I wrote one not too long ago that uh, started out. Uh, I don't want to write another song, but I can't tell that to my mind. It just <laughs> keeps throwing out words and I have to try to make a rhyme. Oh, that is great. You just wrote that one? Yeah. See, still got it. So does that just come to you? You just sit down there and spit it out? <laughs> I love I wrote That's... one called Live Every, Day, Live Every Day Like It Was Your Last, and one day you'll be right. <laughs> <laughs> See, there's the genius right there. There's the genius. <laughs> you also, uh, Willie, I understand, have a book coming out called Willie Nelson's Letters to America. Right. What did you want to sit down and write to America? Well, honestly, Turk Pipkin, the writer, uh, the old friend of mine, is a great writer. And he's really writing the book, and I'm looking at it and say, that's good, you know. But uh, we write together really well. And this is not the first book we've done. So I really like what he's doing on it. And uh, maybe I'm contributing something. I hope so. <laughs> and, and what's the message of the book, Willie? Uh, if you're reading this book, you probably have run out of things to do. <laughs> <laughs> but is it, uh, are you speaking to sort of where the country is right now, Willie? Is that the idea behind it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. you've, you've, you've seen a couple of things in, in your life, Willie, born in the depression and come up through World War II and the civil rights movement in Vietnam and everything you've seen. What do you think about where the country is right now? Well, we have a lot of negatives going. Uh, I, you know, there's a lot of things that people are missing out on. You know, there's a great energy exchange whenever an artist comes to town and people come out and pay money to clap their hands and sing along with him. That's a very therapeutic thing to do. Yes. And to not be able to do that, uh, you know, it's not healthy. And it's not healthy for the musician who can't go play. So uh, this is a very trying time. We'll get through it. It will pass. And uh, uh, maybe uh, next fall, uh, things will get back more to normal. But in the meantime, we just got to tough it out. I noticed, Willie, that your buddy Chris Christofferson announced he's retiring. Chicken. Uh, He's a chicken. (laughs) <laughs> no such announcement from you then i trust <laughs> well i know <laughs> not yet no not yet so you you'll be back as soon as they say you can go you'll be back on that tour bus back on the road yeah there and uh that's right i'll be looking for the next big town good good and speaking of Chris um, and, and Johnny and Whalen and your group in, in the Highwaymen, uh, how do you look back on that moment and that time? Because maybe on paper, those four didn't quite go together. But man, when you, when you sang, it was something special. How much fun was that? That was fantastic. We went all over the world and we had our families with us. Uh, we had 278 pieces of luggage. <laughs> 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 you don't exactly somebody... travel light, do you? <laughs> <laughs> but we had all our wives and kids and everybody, and we went everywhere. And it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. And you made some great music, too. I'm, I'm just curious, Willie, 
at this point in your career, in your life, you are as prolific, it seems to me, as you've been. I'm looking at Willie's Reserve over your shoulder and you've got all these businesses and companies going and you're writing books and recording albums and testing yourself creatively with a Sinatra album and then a gospel album. Where do you find the energy to be, you make us all tired, Willie? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, my wife, Annie, is pretty good at kicking me in the butt every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> she might be doing it right now. I can't see. <laughs> yeah, she is. <laughs> the Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Right now on NBC News Now. They've done things like installing cameras to help alert Border Patrol to people crossing. They are escaping a number of conditions there of violence and persecution in their home countries. Tonight, the CDC's new outdoor mask guidelines. What change that allowed this new recommendation to be made? If we do nothing, what happens to a city like Houston? You're going to repeat this movie over and over again. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Right now on NBC News Now. They've done things like installing cameras to help alert Border Patrol to people crossing. They are escaping a number of conditions there, of violence and persecution in their home countries. Podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd Cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. How do you do it? How do you keep it all straight and how do you run it all so well? Well, I would, you know, I wasn't aware that it was that straight. <laughs> <laughs> from the outside, it looks like it's going okay. Well, I'm doing a good job if I'm covering it up good, I guess. <laughs> but thank you. Know, you. Yeah. Um, Frank Sinatra famously talked about regrets that he had a few. When you look back on your career, can you come up with any yourself? If I changed anything in the back, it would change where I am now. And I really like where I am now, so I wouldn't change a thing. Hmm. That's a good way to look at it. You wouldn't change the road because it brought you where you are right now. Right. Do you ever think back, Willie, at, boy, seven, eight-year-old Willie Nelson in Abbott, Texas, and think, my goodness, how did that little boy get to where you're sitting right now in life with your career? Well, you know, my sister and I have been playing music together all our lives. Yeah. And I figure that's what we'll always do. And I hope we can always do it together. But it's been an incredible, you know, uh, life, being able to play music and make a living doing what you really love to do. And you've given so much joy, Willie, to so many people over the years. There aren't many people, I would say, that all of us can agree on in this country anymore. We're so divided, but I think you and Dolly may be the last two. <laughs> I love Dolly. I was actually interviewing her and she was talking about pretty paper and calling you up and asking if you'd do that song with her and yeah. how much she loved you and was hoping you'd say yes. And you did. So what uh, you've had a chance to work with so many people. You mentioned your friendship with Frank. There's Dolly. Any stand out to you, Willie, over the course of your career where you said, boy, I can't believe well, course, I'm on those, the same stage. Those two, those two for sure. And uh, I got to work with, Ray Price, uh, who was a fantastic singer, and Ray Charles. Um, mm. I've been lucky. So you've done just about everything. Is there anything out there as you look out to the horizon, you say, boy, I still haven't done that and I'd like to try it? I haven't done any skydiving yet. <laughs> No. Does Annie know about this plan? She just no. said no. 
<laughs> Unless she's the one pushing you out of the plane. She might do that. Yeah. I got to ask you one songwriting question, Willie. Um, is there any truth to the legend that you wrote the famous song On the Road Again on the back of a, a air sickness bag somewhere out on the road? Well, yeah, I was at an airplane. I was flying with uh, Sidney Pollock, and they wanted me to write a song. And uh, uh, I, I said, what do you want me to write? He said, well, something about being on the road again. I said, what about this? On the road again? Okay, wait till you get on the road again. Life alone like me. Okay, wait till you get on. How about that? They said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just like do. that? They asked for it and you <laughs> delivered it? That quick. It was that, that easy, wow. really. And so the only thing you had to write it on was the air sickness bag? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Flipped it over and made history, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Threw up and moved on. <laughs> it's gotta be cool. One more question for you, Will. It's gotta be cool to stand on a stage with, with your son, Lucas, and play with him, and also to see the success that he's had. Well, yeah, Lucas and Michael both, they are incredible musicians. And, uh, you know, it's always great to have your kids on stage with you, especially when they're real good. And yeah. These kids are great. Yeah, they're awesome. They're, it's fun to watch, and especially when you hop up there with them. Willie, thanks so much for the time. It's really an honor to talk to you. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Willie. Take care. Thank you. today all day. Summer's almost here and if you're looking for the perfect way to welcome warmer weather my pal Anthony Contrino is sharing his favorite al fresco meal. Not al roca but al fresco. We're talking juicy pork milanese peppery arugula salad an easy anti-pasti along with uncle pasti with olives and of course a classic Italian cocktail to wash it all down. Mmm. Summer is just around the corner. It's not one of my favorite seasons but my birthday's in there, so I'll allow it. Anyway, it is gonna be really nice to be able to dine outside with friends. So today I'm whipping up the perfect al fresco meal. I'll be making delicious orange rosemary marinated olives, the juiciest, crispiest pork milanese that you've ever had, topped with a nice fresh salad. And then of course we need a cocktail or two. I'll be making a Negroni and an Americano. Oh, hi, I didn't see you there. Welcome to the new set of Saucy. Let's get cooking. I'm gonna be making some delicious orange rosemary marinated olives. We love olives in my family. We have them out for every holiday as part of an antipasti. I'm gonna be using orange and rosemary because those are two flavors that I like and that work really well together. So first things first, I have two different kinds of olives. My favorite, Catlovitrano, which are super buttery, and then a little bit more of a pungent flavor with Kalamata olives. I like the two to balance off each other, and they're really pretty when mixed up together later on. For the marinade itself, we'll start by adding some oil. It's about a third of a cup. You can eyeball this into a small saucepan. So first things first, an orange. Any sweet orange will do. This is a plain navel orange. And I'm just cutting a few strips off. Then I like to go back with a knife and carefully, don't hurt yourself here, similar to like filleting fish, remove the bitter pith. We don't need any bitter flavor in our marinade over here. So you can see all the white part is gone and you're left with just the beautiful, super fragrant skin. Right into the pot that goes. Take your time. Better off being safe than sorry with this. And the last one into the pot. Don't want this orange to go to waste. So I'm gonna take that sweet, delicious juice, 
and we'll add that to the pot as well. That'll add a little bit of sweetness to our olives. Next up, garlic. What, what does this happen every time? Six takes later. I'm gonna grab two cloves. You can buy them peeled already, which will save on the aggravation. Okay, so just thin slice, eighth of an inch, even thinner if you can, without hurting yourself, into our pot. Then let's add some more flavor a bay leaf. I'm gonna add a pinch of red pepper flakes. I'm not a big spice person, so I literally just add a tiny little pinch. Last but not least, some fresh rosemary. So I'm gonna cut off a couple of sprigs here and pull off about half of the leaves or just kind of break them. I just like the way it looks when it's in there. It's still gonna permeate that oil. So I'm literally just waiting for the edges to just sort of start to simmer as I'm doing this. It'll go pretty quickly. We're not looking to cook, we're looking to infuse. You'll know it's done when it gets nice and fragrant. Similar when you add garlic and onion to like a saute pan and it's getting there, it's smelling really good already. So you can see it's starting to simmer a little bit. So I'm gonna cut the heat and then Simply just pour it right on top of our olives. Make sure you get all of this flavor. Leave no speck of garlic or rosemary behind. Okay, now I'm gonna let this sit out at room temperature for a couple of hours. So every now and then, every time you pass it, just pick it up, give it a tossy turn, zhuzh it up, get those olives coated nice with that oil to help marinate it and give those olives some time to steep. Hi everybody, good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. Ready actors. An indie horror film, a talented young actress, and a deadly shot. Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Role. Action! Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. What's about to happen on our plaza is you're all going to get your very first COVID vaccine. I'm excited! She's excited. Three, two, two one, two. one. Two. Yes. So grateful. Is that close to prom? Here we go. Everybody, good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. If there's one thing that I can eat for dinner every night, it's pork milanese or any milanese, chicken, anything, pound it thin, fry it crispy, I'm gonna eat it. I'd probably even enjoy shoe leather if it was fried. So right here I have, from my butcher, you can get these at most supermarkets, some nice, beautiful, thick pork loin chops that are boneless. I'm gonna pound them nice and thin so that every inch of this milanese is absurdly crispy. Get yourself a generous sized sheet of plastic wrap. And this is where the fun begins, guys. This may look a little scary, but I promise you it's not. We're going to butterfly these chops. So, I'm gonna place a chop on the plastic wrap, taking a really sharp chef knife. I'm going to find the center, and I'm gonna cut it open like a book. Work slowly, deliberate 
steady slices. And this is just to help get it nice and thin. And I'm just slowly going to start peeling it open. And there you go. If you skip this step and just start pounding, you're gonna be there all day and your meat's not gonna be as tender. So truly don't skip that step. Be sure to leave a little slack around so that our chop has room to grow. Get yourself one of these fun toys and go to town. Watch your fingers, don't do what I almost just did. There you have it. It's about a quarter of an inch thick and we have a gorgeous big cutlet now that is for one person. Just keep going. your kids or your boss piss you off today, this is the perfect meal to make at the end of the day. This one's even better. You can do this with chicken breast. I love it with chicken. You can do it with beef. If you don't have time to go to the gym, this is the perfect activity for you. what it feels like to exercise. <laughs> One to go. That looks great. As easy as that. I am going to wipe down, sanitize, clean my hands, and then we're going to dredge these guys up. Okay, now that that's set up, let's start getting these bad boys breaded. So, free them from the plastic wrap. Look how great that looks. Nice and thin. And when cooking, you wanna make sure you're seasoning in layers. You never wanna just finish with salt because it's just sitting on top and doesn't have time to absorb. Also, when cooking, you want to do all of one action at once. It keeps things neater, it's quicker. This is the bulk of the seasoning, so don't be cheap. And get both sides. The last one's always the annoying one, isn't it? Perfect. Now to begin breading. You may notice that there's something here missing, flour. Growing up, whenever my dad made chicken cutlets or milanese, he never used flour. And when I went to culinary school, I was like, "Where? What, what's with the flour? And I've tested it both ways. In this case, it is an extra ingredient, an extra step, and I find it to be completely unnecessary. It actually coats better to this pork if you don't use flour. So while you're probably thinking, I don't know what I'm talking about, I would curse here, but I'm not allowed to anymore. I definitely do. So this is my dredging station. Three very well beaten eggs and two cups of seasoned breadcrumb. Another trick, wet hand, dry hand. So in she goes. Make sure we're nice and well coated. You can see how great a pie dish works for this. It fits well, it has a flat enough surface and it has sides to keep everything in place. Give it a couple of shakes and right into our breadcrumb. Now, use your dry hand 
to start covering it with the breadcrumb. When you get to this point, you can flip it. Make sure you don't miss a millimeter of breadcrumb. Every crevice, breadcrumb, and press it in. We want these to be well coated and super duper crispy. Just like that. And that's ready to be fried. Make sure you press it on, lock it in there. Isn't that cool? This is kind of a fun thing to get the kids involved in too. Put them to work. Dinner was not for free at my house growing up. Thank God I did most of the cooking. My mom's cooking's atrocious. That's a big one. Time to fry them up. I've added about a quarter of an inch of vegetable oil to a pot. When frying, I like to use a neutral oil like safflower, canola, any vegetable oil, because it won't take on any flavor. Have this going over medium high heat. And I know it's ready when I add a pinch of breadcrumb and we get some sizzle action. So you see how it foamed up and it already started darkening? Time to add one of our cutlets. We're gonna let this fry for about two to three minutes per side until it's deep, golden, gorgeous brown. Keep an eye on the edges of your cutlet. I can see it already starting to get nice and golden brown in that little nook, which means it's almost ready to flip. I'm gonna take a sneak peek. Almost there. For me, any cutlet should be on the brink of being burnt for it to be delicious. Now just another couple of minutes. Transfer it to a wire rack. If you put it on paper towels, it's gonna get a little soggy and the breading is gonna start to fall off. Get another one in really quick. And then while it's still hot, add a nice generous amount of a flaky sea salt. You can see it melting into that hot oil. Some of it won't melt. It'll add a little bit of an extra crunch and extra seasoning. These cutlets are gonna cook really quickly, so keep an eye on the pan. This is not the time to walk away and start another project. Oh my God. extra crispy for the chef. I have my oven set to the lowest setting. I'm gonna throw these in there to keep them warm. I don't wanna keep them in there too long though, just long enough to make a delicious salad. Hi everybody, good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I can track this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. 
And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Congratulations to Lester Holt, the most trusted TV news anchor in America, on receiving the prestigious Edward R. Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award for a career dedicated to excellence in journalism. Right now on NBC News Now. They've done things like installing cameras to help alert Border Patrol to people crossing. They are escaping a number of conditions there, uh, violence and persecution in their home countries. Ready actors. An indie horror film, a talented young actress, and a deadly shot. Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Roll. Action! Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. This peppery arugula is the base of my salad, but any good salad needs a killer dressing, and this is mine, my white balsamic dressing. Going to start by adding a couple of tablespoons of just plain old clover honey. This bougie thing looks like a lot of fun, but it's a little messy. This is gonna add just enough sweetness, some Dijon, which is gonna add more depth of flavor. It's also going to help emulsify this dressing when we add the oil. Get that all in there. A Little bit of salt, about a half a teaspoon. And then about an eighth of a teaspoon of freshly cracked black pepper. Gonna whisk this to combine. Make sure you get that honey to dissolve. That looks beautiful. Now that the base of our dressing's ready, I'm going to drizzle in olive oil. Very slowly begin to drizzle in your olive oil, giving it time to break up the fat molecules and emulsify. If you can see the oil puddling in the vinegar, that means you're adding too much and it's going to not emulsify properly. I did not sign up for this much cardio today. You can see it already starting to thicken. That means that we have a great emulsification. It's a beautiful dressing. Great golden color from the white balsamic and this really good Sicilian olive oil. Mm, gorgeous, gorgeous. Mm, it's perfect. It doesn't need any more seasoning. This is a very simple salad. All I'm going to add to this arugula are some beautiful cherry tomatoes that I'm just gonna have. If you don't have a small utility knife like this, a nice serrated knife, it's a really great kitchen tool. I use it a lot. I'm gonna give this a quick toss. And then add your dressing to taste. This makes more than you need for this, but it stores really well in the fridge in a mason jar or just any sealed container for at least a week. Mm. So all set. All that's left to do is to put the two pieces of the puzzle together. Mm. It smells so good. Okay. These are nice and warm. Let's go with this big guy. Just throw that right onto a plate and then don't be cheap. Oh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Oh. 
then because God forbid I cook something and not put cheese on it. How delicious does this look? I cannot wait to dig in. I'm kind of thirsty. I think I need to make a cocktail. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I can track this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Ellen on her set, what's been a difficult year for her personally and for her show. Very few people go through such huge public humiliation. How can I be an example of strength and perseverance if I give up and run away? Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. I'm going to show you how to make probably the most quintessential Italian aperitivo, which is a pre-meal drink, something meant to whet your appetite. And this bitter compati is going to do just that. That is one of the three major components in this Negroni. This drink is equal parts compati, sweet vermouth, and gin, and it is going to punch you in the face. So I'm doing an ounce and a quarter each of these three spirits. This is our sweet vermouth. To balance that bitterness just the slightest bit. And we can't forget about the gin. This is a London dry gin that I'm using. Then some blood orange. I like to peel it directly into my beaker to catch any oils that come out. And I'm just going to peel off a nice healthy strip. Add some ice. You wanna get this nice and chilled. It's also gonna dilute this the slightest bit. And stir, stir, stir. At least 20 seconds. Really let those flavors combine and let it chill throughout. Perfect. Get yourself some bougie ice. Mmm. So pretty. Then, every cocktail needs a garnish. Another strip of our blood orange skin. Give it a little twist. And then I kind of like to run it on the rim just to get those oils on there. Little extra hint and punch of the orange. Now, if you feel like this is a little too bitter for your palate, we're gonna make its less aggressive cousin, the Americano, which is pretty similar. We're gonna start the same way with our compati, using an ounce and a half this time. And then the sweet vermouth. No gin in this one. So it's not gonna be quite as boozy. Perfect. Same thing. And stir, stir, stir. Mm. 
Or bougie eyes. <laughs> Isn't that such a beautiful color? Then, finally, we'll top it off with club soda. How beautiful that effervescence. Don't forget about our little garnish. Our little straw. There you have it, the perfect Negroni and the Americano. Can't wait to share these with my friends. It is a pretty color. And a little twist. Thank you. You stir. I like dilutes it a little. Welcome. Delicious. Beautiful. Some pork milanese. Nice. Thank you, Anthony. You're welcome. The cell phone line, uh, I get that a lot. What? Outside. Are you kidding? It's at the North Pole out Hey, there. this sign isn't just a decoration. Honey, nothing in here is a decoration. It disturbs the other customer. And, I, and if I'm on, on my cell phone, I get it a lot. And people will point at me and go, you, 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 I'll kick you out of here. You go, ha, 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 you go off your cell phone. I'm like, yeah, OK, bye. <laughs> hey, everybody, it's Scott Patterson. I played Luke Danes on Gilmore Girls in my podcast I am all in. Suki! Hey, I was looking for your pet freak yesterday. Hey, what have I said about the counter? I know. Uh, the counter is a sacred space, my sacred space. You don't do yoga on the Dalai Lama's mat, and you don't come behind my counter, period. Well, my favorite part about playing Luke, you know, having a regular job. It, it's hard to have a regular job in Hollywood. It's very competitive. There aren't a lot of jobs. And it was just knowing that, uh, you know, you were going to go to work and be challenged. But uh, it just the experience of playing such an iconic character and, and you know, the, the feedback that I get on a daily basis from it, it's, it's quite shocking uh, and it still surprises me. So, and it seems to be oddly, you know, growing in prominence. I mean, the, the, the role, the show, uh, you know, the fan base keeps growing globally. I mean, it's just, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's, it's, it's a wonderful experience. Uh, favorite scenes, you know, I, I really think it was that initial uh, scene in the pilot where we see him and we see Lorelai for the first time. Please, Luke. Please, please, please. How many cups have you had this morning? None. Plus? Five, but yours is better. You have a problem. Yes, I do. Junk. I tell her she has a problem. How many cups have you had? I mean, I think that... Because that really sets us on the path. I mean, it was a very difficult scene to play because it had to say so much, but you couldn't. We couldn't really tip our mitts about the potential of the relationship. It just, you know, you know, it was a real balancing act with that scene. Um, and it was, the, and it was when I realized that, uh, you know, how good Lauren was as an actress. And there was only one time I was really nervous on set uh, was when we were preparing to do the first kiss and you know because Lauren and I both wanted to get it right and there's so many traps set up for a situation like that in an acting sense where you can either do too little or do too much so it was the nervousness from both of us was man 
Gosh, I hope we get this right. <laughs> what are you doing? Will you just stand still? And then you just sort of lean back on your on your training and your instincts like, hey, how do I feel about this person? How does Luke feel about her? How would how would he react in this moment? I'm very proud of what we did because I thought it was really you know, it, it had intensity, yet it was soft and tender. Quotes, uh, well, you know, the name of the first episode is Red Meat Can Kill You, enjoy. So, <laughs> it says everything about them. Red Meat Can Kill You, enjoy. What inspired me to launch a Gilmore Girls podcast was the fans are clamoring for content. They are clamoring for connection. They want to be inside that show. They want to be involved in the show. We're not making any episodes for them. Uh, it's been four years now, five years now, uh, since the year in the life. And it's just too long uh, to thirst for the Gilmore drink. And I think any type of uh, comforting voice uh, from the set of the show is going to engage people in a positive way. It's going to support how they feel about the show, their lives. It's going to help them. I mean, fans would love it. And, you know, I, I love chopping it up with the cast members. We always had a lot of fun on set. I thought, well, why not take that feeling and that vibe to a podcast format? And they, I heart thought it was a great idea. And um, here we are, you know, so it's, uh, it's, it's just a lot of fun and kind of my personal love letter to the fans. At the end of the day, the show makes people happy. I mean, it's really a simple formula. And I think the podcast, uh, uh, you know, the intention of the podcast is to continue to make people happy, you know, just from a different angle. It's, you know, watching, I, I watch the episodes that I've never seen before. I invite a guest on, we talk about those episodes and we talk about behind the scenes stuff that nobody knows about, that no one's ever discussed before. So as a character of the show, I've become a fan. So I'm experiencing what the fans are experiencing and it's, and it's really interesting and fun. My favorite episodes to revisit are, well, I think the episode where we, we get the name of the podcast from, that, that episode where I, I declare my undying moment. Uh, love for her and that I am in I am all in uh, I think the first kiss as well I think and I really like the episode where I push Milo in the lake and where I take the sledgehammer to the wall and say we'll hold hands and skip that's your room finish up we'll hold hands and skip afterwards i enjoyed making them all but especially that one because it was finally there was something physical to do instead of like spitting out a million words uh, per second it's so really just all of them but uh uh i mean you really can't go wrong i watched the, i watched the pilot again after 20 years i hadn't seen it in 20 years it's the only show uh that i watched um and i was delighted i thought it was just epic and you know how great the acting was and how great the writing was it just uh, it was magical it does seem as if this white house doesn't want to bring a lot of high profile attention to the issue what efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy what happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Right now on NBC News Now. Here in Chicago, about 20,000 middle schoolers returning to school today. They also took advantage of existing vaccine distribution networks throughout Alaska. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. Right now on NBC News Now. 
Here in Chicago, about 20,000 middle schoolers returning to school today. They also took advantage of existing vaccine distribution networks throughout Alaska. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines, so crucial for reopening America. A big day around here, a very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them, doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! People are particularly stupid today. I can't talk to any more of them. People are particularly stupid today. I can't talk to any more of them. How would I describe Michelle Girard? Um, opinionated. Uh, very specific about what he likes. Um, Good-hearted. He means well. Excuse me. And there's a phone call for you. And if I'm to fetch you like a dog, I'd like a cookie and a raise. Thanks for the peach. The description for Michelle originally, I think they were looking for someone much older. I want to say 60. Um, and then they didn't find apparently what they were looking for. So um, a friend of a friend thought of me for the part. And it was actually my first audition in LA. And when I read it, it felt very much it was something I could do well. But after the audition, I didn't hear anything for two weeks. And I was like, hmm, all right, I guess I was wrong. So I called the person who booked the appointment and he called and he said, no, 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 we loved him. Uh, he's going to come back and have an audition or a call back. But yeah, I, I made him what was my vision to uh, a French person coming to America with all of their specific ways that they want to bring from their own country, but they're in a new culture. So sometimes there's a little clash and um, I thought that was an interesting um, character. My favorite moments for him, there are many, uh, or favorite lines. One line that I <laughs> really thought was funny. People don't mention that line to me, but I think it's a really, really funny line because uh, it's so inappropriate. There was an old lady, I think it's season one, who uh, came to the end and uh, she said, excuse me, sir, do you know where I could find the best antiques? And uh, Michelle response was at your house, I'd guess. Oh, excuse me, sir. Can you tell me where we can find the best antiques? At your house, I'd guess. And I just thought it was so funny because no one would say that in their right mind. Um, but in the episode, I had a lot of fun. Obviously, the episode of the dogs, but um, the Price is Right episode when he goes to LA and he got veneers and Botox. And I don't know, I thought it was really funny. I got Botox. Ow. Dr. Wu, she's a genius. Everyone goes there. And look, I got them done by the same guy who does Nick Lachey. How was it to work with Lauren? Well, first of all, we became friends very quickly. And I think it shows because we're friends in the show, but we have a love and hate relationship, but it's easier to do when you actually love someone. Uh, and to this day, we're friends. So that's probably one of my best um, takeaway from the show is the friendships that I've created with Lauren, with Kelly Bishop, with Melissa. Um, you know, those friendships are for life and that I'm very grateful for that. How meaningful the show is for people how the show has brought family to watch together, how the show have helped uh, people going through tough times, um, and moms and daughters who have said, oh, this is our quality time together, this is our time together. Um, the show meant a lot for people and uh, it was meaningful, and I think that's, um, that's a blessing for an actor to have impacted people in that way. And, uh, Anywhere I go in the world, the reaction is the same. So I'm grateful for that. Oh, I haven't told you the most amazing part yet. You got your boobs done by the same guy who did Pamela Anderson? No, though I did meet him at the Coffee Bean. Why do I think people love Gilmore Girls so much? The writing, the writing is so exquisite. Um, it is not a cynical show. Uh, it is a show with a lot of heart and also 
you know, it's a show about family, but family, your real family, but your extended family, your friends that are becoming your family, the town, the people of the town that are your, your family. So it's really very much about family and being there for each other. And I think, uh, especially now, <laughs> in a time where um, people need comfort, um, I think people still resonate with the show for that. It's a, it's a show from the heart, the quality of the writing. Uh, it's touching, it's funny. And all of these really unique characters coming together, which is, again, another example of families. You know, we are a bunch of eclectic people coming together, connected by the same DNA, um, and we're making it work. And so I think that's the connection. I don't know, yeah. Where do I think Michelle is up to now? Probably uh, pissed at the kids that are running around and screaming in the house. <laughs> <laughs> on the verge of a nervous breakdown, wanting to move back to Paris, <laughs> questioning his life choices. Um, I don't know. Yeah, probably along those lines. <laughs> Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. <laughs> for traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. A huge lift is underway for one of the most celebrated cities in this country, Cleveland, Ohio. Yes. This is the greatest location in the nation. <laughs> We're having a baby. Wow. The big reveal is under the lid. <laughs> hey, now. Things are looking brighter, so we want to help you find the fun in 21. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. We're going to do our part and get vaccinated live. A very special naturalization ceremony. This is a really inspiring group. Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! Our week-long journey begins here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. In Cleveland. Our Across America journey reporting on an America rebuilding and reimagining a future after the pandemic. Breaking news tonight, the ceasefire in the Middle East after 11 days of deadly violence. Richard Engel is on the ground. Do you think there's a connection between policing and racism? How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Killer Role, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. How would I describe Emily Gilmore? I used to say Emily Gilmore is a piece of work. She's um, no nonsense. Uh, she's smart. She's uh, conservative. She has values that are very kind of straight laced. Uh, she's not foolish. She's, uh, she's up with current things, but there's a certain uh, value system that she expects people to live by, particularly her daughter. What was my favorite part about Emily? Well. I like the clothes. Uh, they spent a lot of money on my wardrobe. I liked her attitude. I mean, she was so difficult and demanding and uh, hard to please as far as Lorelei was concerned. Uh, and what I really loved about that whole show was Amy Sherman Palladino's writing, because it's some of the best material I've, it's probably the best material I've ever done. And, uh, oh God. Amazing, funny, smart, on top of it, and as everybody knows, really fast. So uh, that was just one of the many favorite things. I love doing that show. Lauren and I, uh, the day we met, it was like, okay, I could do this. And she and I became so close and still are close. She really is like a daughter to me, and I really am kind of like a mother to her. We don't spend a lot of time you know, talking to each other or texting or anything like that, but whenever we get together, it just clicks right in again. There's just a real love and trust and and pleasure. You know, we 
we have the same sense of humor. Uh, yeah, she's she's great. I'm I'm really crazy about Lauren. My all-time favorite episode, actually the one that tickles me the most because it was so different. There was one uh, where uh, Richard, my husband's uh, mother, who was a very difficult woman, uh, had passed away, and. Uh, I found, if I recall correctly, I found a letter that she had written to him the night before our wedding, I think, begging him not to marry me. I know that the timing of this is particularly awkward since you are to be married tomorrow. No way! But your happiness is too important to me, so timing be damned. She wanted Dad to leave you at the altar. She begged him to leave me at the altar. She begged him in writing and then she saved the carbon. And uh, that sort of sent me off. He wasn't there to support me because he was so grieving for his mother that during that episode I was drinking. There was even one scene where I was smoking a cigarette. I, I called it my, the Tennessee Williams episode for me. Who was that at the door? It was Jason. Dad needs to sign something. Uh-huh. I mean, she was just out there. She was so un-Emily. Uh, that was great fun. I really had fun doing that one. There were a few episodes that I really liked, but that one was just such a departure. Uh, that and then later, um, in those last four episodes that we met, the special four, uh, when I uh, went after the uh, DAR ladies. I rather enjoyed that too. What the hell is going on? I can't do it anymore. Can't do what? I can't spend any more time and energy on artifice and bullshit. Why do you love that word so much? The zingers and the put downs, oh boy. Uh, actually, one of my first ones, one of the reasons I love the pilot script so much, I, I couldn't believe this pilot script when I got it. It was so funny. And I had no idea who any of these people were or, or who the writer was, anything like that. It's when uh, Lorelai comes to see her parents in the pilot script, obviously to ask for money for Rory's education. And uh, I opened the door and I said something to the effect of, is it Christmas? Hi, Mom. Lorelai. My goodness, this is a surprise. Is it Easter already? <laughs> or is it Easter? It was some holiday which was indicative of perfect writing, of saying that's how often they saw each other. It was on, on holidays, Christmas, Easter, whatever it was. And then uh, Richard, my husband's character, comes in sometime later after we've done this scene, and he basically does the same thing with a different holiday. Hi, Dad. What is it? Christmas already? Lorelai was taking a business class at the college today and decided to drop in to see us. Favorite moments with Ed Herman. I just loved working with him. We really liked each other so much. I know, I know one of my favorite uh, scenes with him was when we did renew our vows. <laughs> And he, we danced to the song, Bill, and he said, today, I mean, that was your favorite, you know, your favorite song, and today you can call me Bill. Emily would tease me, saying, if only your name was Bill, then this could be our song. <laughs> well, Emily, for tonight, and tonight only, my name is Bill, and this is our song. That was wonderful, you know. Uh, he was such a good actor and very generous. Very professional, but just a sweet, good man. Why is it still cooking? First of all, it's very intelligent. I mean, if you the smarter you are, the more you get it. And it's fast, and so you gotta pay attention. You don't have much time to laugh because you gotta catch up with what's going on. Um, it's funny. I mean, it's, it really is a funny show. But what I decided was that there's really an innate sweetness about it which sounds kind of icky, but it's not that. There's a, there's a decency about it. Um, and one of the things that men started, when men started watching it, which they weren't inclined to because it was Gilmore Girls and all that sort of thing, uh, is that if you look at the male characters in that show, there's no nasty guy, there's no jerk, there's no misogynist, uh, there's no violence, they're just trying to make their way in the world like all the rest of us. And so there's, what there is basically is an innate decency about these people. They're good people. There's, some of them are very strange, but they're, they're good. And I heard a wonderful uh, story last year sometime that very often um, 
when the troops come back from maneuvers in places like Afghanistan and places that we you know, hear too much about, they very often sit down and watch Gilmore Girls. And I think it's because it's a feel-good place. It's like, this is what America is supposed to be. This is what, you know, this is what we want it to be, and this is what it was <laughs> and can be again. So there's, there's a real decency about it. There's no, it's not mean-spirited. And I think that's, that's just very appealing. And then on top of that, I just think it's very funny. It's a very funny show. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. <laughs> Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high-profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. A huge lift is underway for one of the most celebrated cities in this country, Cleveland, Ohio. Yes. This is the greatest location in the nation. <laughs> We're having a baby. Wow. The big reveal is under the lid. <laughs> hey, now. Things are looking brighter, so we want to help you find the fun in 21. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. For breaking news in our changing world, Download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Bring a lot of money because I'm going to overcharge you like you've never been overcharged before. So there was one line in the script that said, um, I miss my home. And she's looking at the windshield wipers. Gypsy. I miss my home. Put them back. I miss my home. Like her home was some village far away. Because it didn't say I miss being at home. It was like I miss my home. So that's when I decided to give her an accent, but from somewhere, we don't know where exactly. She's a gypsy. I think gypsy is a no-nonsense, tough businesswoman with a heart of gold. I think gypsy, gypsy likes to uh, give people a hard time, but she really, I think gypsy, if your car was stuck on the side of the road, gypsy would come and give you a tow. Like she would have a, I just knew she, she should have like a big watch and a denim shirt. And I decided to put my hair in pigtails. I don't remember why, but I remember getting to the audition and looking around the room and there were really funny people there and I just thought, I have to distinguish myself from these other people. My very first day on set, what I remember about working with Ed Herman was he was so kind. We had a Michigan connection, so we talked a lot about Mackinac Island and fudge and just like being an actor and he was just so welcoming and warm. and. And it really, it relaxed me. I mean, I remember having to do the scene over and over again, and it was cold, and it was just so much fun. I, I just, I'm glad that the, that it started with something with the car right away to make me really feel like, okay, this is it. She, she works on cars. But I'm telling you, there's nothing wrong with this car. I am paying you for a service. I would like that service performed. Okay, I look again. I love that. I love that scene with the two windshield wipers because they're both, I think they're both like six, over six feet tall, Ed Herman was very tall, and I'm five foot three and three quarters. Okay, I found something wrong. You did? What? Windshield wipers came right off in my head. Very dangerous. Thank God I check it again. Gypsy, you broke those off yourself. Yes, I did. So <laughs> it was a lot of fun. I remember the one where Gypsy um, and Andrew have a big fight about parking or something. I loved that one because I love to get really mad at Andrew. That was really fun. I looked, backed up. No. I did two back up. You backed up. You didn't look. You got in, you turned on your car, and then you whipped out of that space like you were Lizzie Grubman. Tweet I timing or what? Liz Torres and Sally Struthers were just favorite actresses of mine growing up. I mean, but I watched them on All in the Family, and I was just such a huge fan. So I had to get over being intimidated by like, oh my God, these people, I'm actually going to be with them. The festival is tomorrow, and I have to start squeezing my lemons, and I don't have my equipment or my booth. And to this day, fans say to me, they wanted me to say something as Gypsy. 
I'll say either that, something about lemonade, or um, how can a stupid donut be happy? I think that probably is my favorite line. How can a stupid donut be happy? I love things like that where you're like, oh, you found out that she like has a lemonade stand, you know, can knit, knit a big long sweater. That, that was really fun. Gypsy loved Lorelai and Rory. And I think that they were both so much fun to work with. I got to know them a little more in the revival, I think, because um, in the original, I think I was in maybe, oh, I loved the episode where I had Emily's bachelorette party where I got to go to her house <gasps> and just stand on the porch with Lauren. Gypsy was like in heaven, like, oh. And that's why, and it was one of my favorite lines is, who's Emily? Hey, Gypsy, thanks for coming on such short notice. Hey, I'm always up for a good party. Emily's in the living room with the others. Great. Who's Emily? Follow me up, point her out. Okie okay, dokie. Okay. There was a scene where that they broke up, so the town was split, and we wore pink ribbons or blue ribbons. And I remember having to say, like, Luke fixes his own truck. It was no choice for me. Luke fixes his own truck, so I make bupkis off him. But you, you don't know, I pissed in front of pepper on. Like, she didn't care about Luke. But I remember making a decision that Gypsy didn't think Luke was good enough for Lorelai, that Gypsy wanted better for Lorelai. Why do I think Gilmore Girls is so loved? I think that there is a, the world is hard, you know, and there's such a cozy, safe feeling when people check into Stars Hollow. I know I've met people that say, if I've had a long day at work, I turn it on and it's like a cozy blanket. And they feel like it's a little town. I think everyone fantasizes about living in a town where your neighbors kind of know your business, even though it might be annoying, it would still be kind of fun. There's something very comforting about it. And I've met people that actually said that when they were recovering from an illness or you know, going through something really, really difficult, they put it on as this escape because it's so, it's just comforting. And I love the fact that, like when it was on, I don't know if it was super, super popular. I don't think it was. I love being on something that grew in popularity. And that's why it is very, it's great that there's streaming services that, and DVDs and things that people can watch, you know, that they can get, fall in love with it and turn other people onto it. I meet a lot of men too that say like, oh, my wife liked it, so I started watching it. Now I love it. So I, I love when that happens. Okay, have you ever spotted someone walking down the street, admired their style and thought, how do they make themselves look so fashionable? I know, well, that is exactly what happened with two friends from San Francisco. And that conversation led to a passion project and a book. It's called Chinatown Pretty, celebrating the fashionable seniors living in their neighborhood. Take a look. The Chinatown Pretty style is really this patchwork of contrast a lot of pattern clashing and a big mix of colors. San Francisco-based photographer Andrea Lowe and writer Valerie Liu have always been awed by the eclectic styles of senior citizens in the city's Chinatown. We'd just look at each other and be like, did you see that? Where did they get these articles of clothing and accessories? And how did they, they compose these next level outfits? In 2014, after a dim sum date where they spent more time focusing on the fashionable elders and the food, the two friends started Chinatown Pretty, a project celebrating the street style of seniors living in the neighborhood. That's nice. With a Cantonese translator, the duo takes laps around the area and stop fashionable locals for a photo and an interview. And we'll just say, good morning, Joe-san and usually just compliment them on the thing that catched our eye. And from there, you know, we try to ask how their day's going and let the conversation evolve naturally. Jacket's good. Very warm, very good. And after seven years of doing gallery shows and articles for local magazines, Chinatown Pretty became a book featuring more than 100 senior citizens from six Chinatowns across North America. One person we met, was this woman in a magical alleyway called Ross Alley in San Francisco. And when we asked her to lift up her fleece pants, there are these pink socks that read, my favorite salad is mine, which is like the last thing you would expect on, on someone who's like in their 80s. I think that's a running theme throughout the outfits is uh, the element of surprise and delight. Through fashion, Valerie and Andrea were able to connect and unlock countless stories. It's a demographic that doesn't get seen or heard a lot. And, you know, it's important to share their stories. A lot of them have immigrated, leaving their families behind, been through war, are refugees, the list goes on and on. And there's so much resilience that we can learn from them. One senior featured in the San Francisco chapter is 87-year-old Dorothy G.C. Kwok who's also known as Polka Dot. She works as a tour guide and documentary film researcher, and in her free time, distributes food pantry deliveries to neighbors. I mix and match 
whatever is given to me to make outfits out of them that is comfortable for me. I don't follow any fashion. I have my own fashion. If I'm called polka dot, I should have at least one outfit. She was born and raised in Chinatown and she has a lot of history there. It was very difficult because we were discriminated. My father had died when I was 12 years old. With seven siblings, it became very difficult to survive. But I got married after the second year of college and decided to move. But I was determined to come back someday where my roots are. Dorothy was walking me through Chinatown and telling me stories of her childhood there or growing up. And I've learned so much from her. I was so proud and so surprised that people love it. The writing that Valerie has commentaries on really explains a lot about people and really gives a highlight that immigrants especially, they have a life that can be full. The first quarter of 2021 saw a 169% increase in anti-Asian hate crimes. It is Andrea and Valerie's hope that Chinatown Pretty can shine a light on the humanity, understanding, and joy that can occur when we stop and connect with one another. I think that Chinatown Pretty is one example of how we can perhaps change or expand the general public of who and what we are by revealing some of our personal stories that go with the fashion. We are living beings and that we are as human as anyone else. They're in their 80s and 90s and living their best urban lives. They're meeting with friends in the park. They're playing chess. They're watching opera. We go by Popo Holeng, which is, damn grandma, you look good in Cantonese. Damn, Grandma, you look good. They do look that good. is awesome. Oh, God, I hope you guys check this out. Check out Chinatown Pretty. Head to today.com slash shop. Tonight, the CDC's new outdoor mask guidelines. What change that allowed this new recommendation to be made? If we do nothing, what happens to a city like Houston? You're going to repeat this movie over and over again. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Our Across America journey here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. Kentucky. Cleveland reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow of a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Ready actors. An indie horror film, a talented young actress, and a deadly shot. Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Role. Action. Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines, so crucial for reopening America. A big day around here, a very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Judith has made it her mission to help other women her age find a confident sense of style. For many, the mirror can sometimes spark criticism instead of confidence. Mostly I think about fashion and styles is stuff for other people. It's more, I hope I don't embarrass myself by what I put on. And for some, like Joan Marquis, trying to keep up with changing trends can be overwhelming. Judith Rizzio is trying to prove that doesn't need to be the case. I'm not real big on the fashion rules. It's just sort of like waking up and figuring out where am I going today? How do I want to look? To me, it's fun. Judith, a former teacher and artist, has been in love with fashion her whole life. Now a self-proclaimed style activist, she believes everyone has the right to feel confident in clothing. You want to make fashion accessible to everyone. That's the key word. Our culture has such an idea around who has the privilege and the right to enjoy fashion. You know, if you're not the right size, if you're not the right age, or don't have the right amount of money. 
A year ago, the 65-year-old fashionista launched Out of Our Closet, an affordable styling service based in Portland that helps women over 50 transform their wardrobe and their lives. Out of Our Closet is designing a personal fashion style so you don't disappear. And it's not just disappearing on the outside. How does it, yeah, do that. It's that sense of disappearing within yourself. And I get really emotional about that at times because I just see that happen so much. How are you? It's why she wants to help Joan rediscover her sense of style, beginning inside her closet. The idea that I get to uh, dive in there and make some changes is, is what I do and what I love to do with you today, okay? Okay. All right. You're a breast cancer survivor. Did that in some way impact your sense of you know what you get out of clothing having gone through the experience mm -hmm. made me want to hide more mm -hmm. don't notice me don't notice what they did let's just move on kind mm -hmm. of a feeling but we got to celebrate <laughs> that you're six years cancer free okay it's time to have some presence in the world and we can do that with fashion Rizzio suggests getting rid of anything that is ill-fitted and dated. Are you ready to try some things on and see what we could put together for you? I'm ready. We, I say we. It's all her. <laughs> Next stop, shopping. Ooh, it fits you just right. Judith's so rules wonderful. for success, you don't need to spend a lot of money to look good. There are clothes out there that look a lot more expensive than they are, you know, yeah. being in a store, and that's fun. Take a chance by stepping out of your comfort zone. Give a twirl, give a You're twirl, You're like girl. swinging Woo! into the party. Oh my, oh my gosh. gosh. I'm willing to try probably most of what Judith will suggest. So I trust her. That doesn't mean I'm gonna wear it out in public, but I'll try it. <laughs> but most importantly, wow. stay true to yourself. It feels like you. It really yeah, does. This does. It does. Working with Judith has given me more confidence and creativity. Now I feel better about myself. It's okay to be out in the world. It's okay to be noticed because that's a good thing. I just want women to realize no matter who you are, you have the right to that. Feeling good in yes. yourself and feeling confident Ooh, very and nice. feeling hot in your clothes or whatever you want to feel um, is good, good medicine. Yes. This is so fun! I love it. Oh. Well, believe it or not, most of the outfits in Judith's closet are thrifted. She says it's important, again, for fashion to be fun but affordable. That is the key. And that's why she provides her services at a very low cost, sometimes even for free. Harper's Bazaar is here to help us with our skincare needs. They mm. called up a who's who of dermatologists and came up with a list of expert approved products for their annual anti-aging awards. Yeah. That's right, and here to walk us through some of the winners is director Jessica Matlin, and we've got our trusty QR code in the corner there as well, so you can shop along as we go. Jessica, it's good to have you up on the connection yeah. this morning. Good morning. Good Where do you morning, want to start? Good morning, Jessica. Let's, let's start with it this. We need to be here. <laughs> we need a clean palette to begin, all right? We need to start off fresh. So what's your best cleanser? So we love this CeraVe cleanser. It is oh, a is cream to foam cleanser, and I love that you get that really hydrating feeling from the ceramides, and you also get that refreshing foaming feeling. And CeraVe is so hot right now that, I mean, this brand is on fire, and I have to tell you, the price is right. Yeah, eleven ninety nine. Yeah, and Craig uses yeah. that's it. That's mine. Yeah, it's good. It's like yeah, you get it right yeah. at the drugstore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think all the supermodels like Craig use it. <laughs> okay, what about a serum? Yeah, because those serums can oh. have all kinds of good ingredients in them. Okay, so serums, yeah, this is your action pack. Like, this is the step really worth adding. And we have two here. We have one from Estee Lauder and one from Drunk Elephant. And oh. Estee Lauder, you may recognize this one because it's the top mm -hmm. serum in the country. Mm -hmm. And this is great for all skin types, all you know, all ages, and it's going to really address a multitude of skin of um, anti-aging concerns. The Drunk Elephant one, you're going to get retexturizing it's going to improve your skin tone it's mm. going to help plump your skin it's going to get that bounce back i love it carson wants the drunk elephant okay uh <laughs> moisturizers we got you got a couple that we need we need one that's for the face and one for those uh the soft skin around the eyes 
okay, Drunk Elephant. I'm sorry, not Drunk Elephant. <laughs> These are both drugstore ones. I'm still stuck on Drunk Elephant because that <laughs> name is like gets in your head, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Aven is a great French brand and you can get it at the drugstore. So it's like, ooh la la, you feel a little like fancy. But this is your SOS cream for when you have any redness. So whether you, you know, kind of overdid it on the at-home facials, I know I did this pandemic, uh, or you just have sensitive skin, it is a beautiful cream that is going to take down any redness. Rock is the leader in retinol. Mm-hmm. And if you have, if you're noticing a little extra crow's feet from all of these zooms, just put it under your eyes. You're going to see results in four weeks, but in 12 weeks, boom, you're really going to notice a difference. Just an under eye cream. It really takes away the wrinkles. Take, put that one to it's the real, it's Retinol a is proven to help. Okay. Proven to help with uh, reducing wrinkles. Or the appearance of wrinkles. Yeah. The, way they that. <laughs> <laughs> the appearance of wrinkles, but it really does make a difference. So yeah, retinol is your best friend mm-hmm. in that department. Okay. Now let's get to some really fun stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Lip masks. Lip masks are fantastic for, I mean, it, like it sounds like it's complicated. It really is just a souped up lip balm. I keep one by my bedside. I love this Laneige lip sleeping mask in the sweet candy flavor. It's fantastic for really ex- hydrating the lips. You really need that year round, whether it's air conditioning, mm-hmm. heating. Mm-hmm. It's a really fun little lip treat and it tastes good. It's like a little dessert. Okay. Oh, wow. I like both and of those. And you sleep with it on your lips all night? Yeah, it's, right. it, it's okay. just really like an extra, you know, souped up lip cream, okay. lip balm. All what right. about now, the peel? Dr. I love to Yeah, explain, the peel, you? yes. Okay. Peel sounds kind of scary. It's really just a fantastic exfoliator. This is a two-step. Dr. Dennis Gross is one of the top dermatologists in New York City. He's famous for his in-office peel, but now you can get really amazing results with this one at home. One step, two step, no muss, no fuss. It doesn't hurt. It's really gentle and you can use it every day. It's just like a very quick and easy clean pad to use like every single day. And you're going to notice a nice fresh spring glow. We all have dull skin from being inside. I mean, I've been inside for like a year now. You're just going to get that bright. Yeah, yeah, you're going to get a bright, fresh glow. Real quick, just uh, just a quick shout out for sunscreen. We just have a couple of seconds left. Okay, sunscreen. You need it. We all need it. L to MD, absolute germ favorite, Harper's Bazaar favorite. It goes missing in the office. Mm-hmm. It is the best. All mm-hmm. skin tones. You're going to love it. Harper's Bazaar beauty director, Jessica Madlin, bringing the heat this morning. Good Thank recovery, you, Jessica. Jessica. Thanks, Our Across America journey here in Louisville, Orlando, Kentucky. In Cleveland. Reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow of a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high-profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Right now on NBC News Now. Here in Chicago, about 20,000 middle schoolers returning to school today. They also took advantage of existing vaccine distribution networks throughout Alaska. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking great. Yeah. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. A huge lift is underway for one of the most celebrated cities in this country, Cleveland, Ohio. Yes. This is the greatest location in the nation. <laughs> We're having a baby. Wow. The big reveal is under the lid. <laughs> hey, now. Things are looking brighter, so we want to help you find the fun in 21. <laughs> Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. Ready actors. An indie horror film, a talented young actress, and a deadly shot. Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Roll. Action! Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. Congratulations to Lester Holt, the most trusted TV news anchor in America, on receiving the prestigious Edward R. Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award for a career dedicated to excellence in journalism. Tonight, the CDC's new outdoor mask guidelines. What change that allowed this new recommendation to be made? If we do nothing, what happens to a city like Houston? You're going to repeat this movie over and over again. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Getting older can leave a lot of us feeling a little uncomfortable, but lucky for us, acclaimed journalist, author, activist, and longtime friend of the Today Show, Joan London, wrote a new book. I love the title. Why did I come into this room? A candid conversation about aging. 
Joan, good morning. Have you seen my glasses lately? I can't find them anywhere. Oh, I know. <laughs> I mean, that's what we're talking about. We get older and suddenly we kind of feel like, am I losing it? Why did I walk into See, this room? See, if you're in your 20s and you can't find something, you don't think anything about it because you're not programmed to worry. But once you're in your 40s, 50s, and you start like coming out of the mall saying, where did I park my car? Yes. Or oh looking for your glasses and you go all over, you look in every coat pocket and then you realize, they're on your face? Yes, yes. <laughs> Been there, done that. Now, it's it's interesting because, as I understand it, you decided to write this book, and it kind of sprung from an appearance on the Today Show a couple years back. Well, I was doing a special series for the show on the value of friendships and companionship, which is even more important as we get older. And I had an interview with The Hollywood Reporter, a phone interview, to talk, you know, to promote the series. And this guy answered. I could tell he was young when he answered. <laughs> but his first question was, what's it like now going back to morning TV as a senior citizen? That was his first question. <laughs> Were you like, wait, who is the senior wait, citizen? Like, what? Who are you talking about? This is Joan London. And I, it just, like, stopped me in my tracks. But it started me thinking about, is that how I'm perceived now? because of my age. And why are we so tied to age? If you have four women that are all 62, they're probably incredibly different. And the worst description is that they're 62. The danger is that when we start thinking of ourselves as that age, yes. sometimes we start to think that we are less capable, that we can have less things we can expect to happen in our lives. Actually, telling someone's age is the least descriptive thing you yes, could really say absolutely. about them when you think about it. You actually say in the book to, to think about what age you feel. Yes. And everybody's got a number in their head. Do you yeah. have a number? I, I guess I do. What's I, your number? I mean, I might say like 38 or something. That's 35, a very normal. Which I would like that. Mine's but frankly, 45. I like being four. I mean, I'm in my 40s. I'm 48. I love being it's in my 40s. It's usually 10 years younger, though, oh, as so. to how your brain <laughs> yes. thinks of yourself. Yeah. What do you think women are most reluctant to talk about when it comes oh. to aging? You know, there are so many things that happen to women that don't happen to men because of declining estrogen. Yeah. And I mean, you're. You, besides the hot flashes, people tend to say the okay talking about hot flashes, but in regards to someone else having them. Yes. But there are so many other things. Um, and I mean, leaky bladders. Yeah. You know, discomfort in sex. I mean, there's the inability to sleep, a loss of libido, expanding waistlines. These things are annoying. But, and they're worrisome to a woman because so often we just think it's happening to us. Like, what's wrong with me? And the next thing is, is to say, oh, I'm not as appealing, I'm not as desirable. And then, you know, it kind of goes down that track. If we just stop letting these things be taboo, yeah. and we all started talking about them because they happen to everyone. Why don't we all just talk about it? You have, there's so many, there's just like lovely little nuggets. I think this will really make people feel good when they read this book. You have some, um, you have like a list, it's called Decline to Decline. Yep. And it embodies your attitude, so we can actually go through them. One of them, I like this, get in the sunshine and fresh air. Well, you know, interestingly, isolation according to experts, is as dangerous to your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Wow. And so it sounds mundane and like so simplistic, but getting out. Take a little walk, even if take your a back walk. hurts or whatever, just a little bit. And, you know, they say the three things that will really predict how well you age are staying engaged in life, having social connections, join clubs, get yeah. friends. So you, when you wake up in the morning, you have somebody to talk to and to relate to and share things with. And the last thing is having a sense of purpose. Yeah. So, and you don't have to join some big club or something, just do a good deed. Um, yeah. You know, there's a lot like of ways to accomplish it. I like you put energy in your voice. Oh. Why do you say that? Because while some people get louder because they can't hear, women especially, they start to talk so, more mm. softly. And you become meek, you become, uh, unengaged, and you, they say sing at home. Hmm. You, don't, you don't have to do it out in public, yeah. just at home. But if you sing, it's hard to sing to a song in a whisper. Yeah. So it like lets you bring your voice out. And that really engages you again in life. And it's so important to be an active member of life. Well, like I said, there's a lot that's really fun in this book. It's uh, you get good information, but it's got such a nice, light, warm heart about it. I don't know if you've gotten to the last chapter, but it's I want to be cremated. It's my last chance for a smoking hot body. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? 
We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring is sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. <laughs> Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Right now on NBC News Now. Here in Chicago, about 20,000 middle schoolers returning to school today. They also took advantage of existing vaccine distribution networks throughout Alaska. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high-profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Ready, actors. An indie horror film, a talented young actress, and a deadly shot. Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Roll. Action! Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. There's a saying that aging is a fact of life, but what if it didn't have to be? Yeah, it may sound like science fiction, but our next guest says ending aging. That's right. Ending aging hmm. is reality that's closer than you might think. Andrew Steele is a computational biologist, hmm. but he's also the author of the new book. It's called Ageless, the new science of getting older without getting old. Andrew, good morning. Al Roker's been waiting on this segment <laughs> I'm telling you. All, all month. That's right, and it's coming for you guys, too. Uh, get ready. Hey, so attention. here's the thing, Andrew. You say that aging isn't inevitable, and one of the ways that we, we can stop it is by targeting citizen cells. What, what, what are those cells that's actually happening in the science of aging? And why aren't we talking more about that? Yeah, I think a lot of us think that the aging process is this inevitable fact of life, that as we get older, we inevitably get a higher risk of disease, we get wrinkles, we get gray hair. But actually, by targeting the hallmarks of the aging process, the underlying cellular and molecular causes of aging, we can slow it down globally. And yeah. senescent cells that you mentioned are a great example. They're something that accumulate in all of our bodies as we get older. And they don't just sit there sort of benign old cells. They actually emit a toxic cocktail of molecules that effectively accelerate the aging process. Now, that sounds like bad news, but the good news is that we've got drugs that can target these cells. You can kill the senescent cells and leave the rest of the cells in your body unharmed. And if we give these drugs to mice aged about 24 months, and that's about 70 years old in human terms, these mice basically get biologically younger. What? They live a couple of years longer, which is a good, good, good start. But they also get less cancer. They get less heart disease. They get less cataracts. They can run further and faster on a little mousy treadmill they use in these experiments. <laughs> they even have better fur. These animals just look great. So what this is showing us is that by targeting these senescent cells and other hallmarks of aging too, we can really globally affect the aging process. And what I'm most excited about with these senolytic drugs, as they're called, is there are already 20 or 30 companies trying to turn this from something that's on the lab bench to something that's actually in I human beings. Are. Clinical trials are happening now. So this could be with us in the next few years. So I imagine this kind of works out where, you know, if, if you have a pill that extends your life a little bit longer and then you live a little bit longer, then technology improves so that you can live longer than that. So I I mean, it's it's not totally wild that we could just not age, right? Yeah, I like to talk about a cure for aging, which is quite a bold thing to talk about, right? But I don't imagine that as a single miracle pill that we're all going to pop and suddenly live forever. Yeah. What's going to happen is it's going to be a succession of technological change. So, you know, say you take one of these early senolytic treatments, that might add a few years to your lifespan. And what that means is that scientists then have those few years to develop another treatment that might target another hallmark of aging. And then maybe that adds another few years to your life. And eventually we're going to get to a point where technology is moving forward fast enough that your funeral is sort of disappearing over the horizon faster than you can chase it. And so that's what I mean by a cure for aging, not a single pill, but a whole mm -hmm. constellation of treatments targeting these hallmarks. Hmm. But, but there are things that we can do now that are not necessarily all that, that technological that we can actually do to, to extend our, our lifespan. Definitely, and there's nothing like writing a book about aging to really make you focus on health advice. There's actually a chapter of health advice in the book. And I mean, the first motivation is that if you live long enough in good health, you could live to a point where you could benefit from some of these treatments. So that's mm -hmm. really exciting. But the second thing is that looking at some of these bits of advice, well, let's give some examples. There are things like, you know, not eating too much, not smoking, making sure you get enough exercise, making sure you get enough sleep. These are all fairly basic bits of health advice that most of us know. But actually, once you understand something about aging biology, you realize that you're not just, you know, 
targeting one particular disease, you're actually slowing down the aging process globally. So that's made me much more excited about these, you know, seemingly basic sounding bits of advice. Can we, hey, then, Andrew, can you, I'm just curious. Brush your teeth. Brush your teeth. I saw that. What, how does that help you, you extend your life? Yeah, so one of the other things is that understanding aging biology really illuminates some less conventional bits of health advice. Um, and brushing your teeth is one of them. So we know that brushing your teeth and basically maintaining good dental hygiene can reduce something called chronic inflammation, which we know mm -hmm. contributes to the whole panoply of the aging process. And so, you know, when you brush your teeth, you're getting rid of those bacteria in your mouth, you're reducing inflammation, and that can reduce your risk of heart disease. It can possibly even, the science is still coming in, but maybe reduce your risk of dementia. So what this shows you is that, you know, brushing, flossing every day, as I now do religiously, it's not just going to reduce your dental bills, it can potentially slow down the whole aging process. Wow, and get, so this way you don't ever have to see your dentist, because nobody likes their <laughs> right. dentist. You know, Everybody it's, hates their it's, dentist. It's such a fascinating conversation. I mean, we've been talking about the fountain of youth since before any of us were sitting here. What is our takeaway, Andrew, for people who are listening to this topic of, of conversation when it comes to aging? What do you want people to know? I think the single most important thing is that we need to raise the profile of okay. this field of biology because it's just so exciting. Um, you know, we've got a, a, the way that we do medicine at the moment is that we treat individual end stages of the aging process. We treat cancer, we treat heart disease, we treat dementia, and we do all that in silos. But the promise of this field is that we'll be able to develop preventative treatments that will stop aging and stop us getting ill in the first place. Mm. And I think this could be the greatest revolution in healthcare since the discovery of antibiotics. So I want everyone mm. to be talking about it. I want to talk about it in you know bars and dinner parties. I was just about to say. I would love to sit next to you at a dinner party. Andrew, just not to be a buzzkill, yeah. what about the ethical concerns? Like folks yeah. who would be watching or listening and who would say, human and beings it's, aren't, it's, aren't designed to live forever. We're supposed to participate in this cycle of life. You, <laughs> no, you're I born, you live, and you die. Also, it's also Green Week. I mean, can the Earth sustain population? A, I mean, a couple of years. Can I just have an forever. extra couple of years? What say you to that, Andrew? These are really fascinating questions. Actually, I think the most common question I get is, can the Earth sustain this level of population? The fact is, you've got to look at what's on the other side of the balance sheet here. Aging, I characterize in the book, as the world's biggest humanitarian challenge. Of the 150,000 people who die every day, 100,000 of them, so two thirds, die because of aging. They die of the cancer, the heart disease, the dementia that the aging process causes. So this is the world's biggest cause of suffering, I would contend. Mm. And if we can remove that, but we have to work a bit harder sorting out climate change, or there are, you know, there are some social issues, these are things we're going to have to work through. But this is such a huge potential benefit, I just can't see there's an argument against it, to be honest. We are grateful that Harry Smith is with us this morning to share it. Hey, buddy. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Savannah. Good morning, Harry. <laughs> Good to see each other yet. Uh, you know, when you think about it, you think about world history, the world can be uh, an ugly, brutal, even evil place to be. And if you're a person who has endured some of that, a lot of that, and to come away and say, you're the happiest person in the world, we thought, we got to meet this guy. Mm. My dear new friends, with a ready smile and a twinkle in his eye, a man of indeterminate age holds his audience spellbound. I was at the bottom of the pit, so if I can make one miserable person smile, I'm happy. <laughs> Eddie JQ describes himself as the happiest man in the world. We wonder if perhaps he is also the wisest. I do not hate anyone. Hate is a disease which may destroy your enemy, but will also destroy you in the process. His 2019 TED Talk in Sydney, Australia, ended with a standing ovation. When we spoke with the 101-year-old recently, we were equally impressed. Where there is life is hope. If there's no more hope, you're finished. Dismissible bromides from a harmless old timer, these are not. Eddie JQ was born Eddie Jakubowicz in Germany. He is a Holocaust survivor. This is me when I came back. I read your book. It sounds to me like you are very proud to be German. Very proud, because I thought I live in the most civilized, most cultured, and certainly the most educated country in Europe. And I was German first, and German second, and Jewish at home. None of which mattered to a nation a people gone mad. People, society should not forget what happened. I don't hate no one, not even the German.
but I despised them. Six million Jews worked to death, starved to death, tortured and murdered. What I have seen, it is incredible. I tell this to people, but they don't want to believe it. I was finally transported to what became my hell on earth, Auschwitz. My parents and sister were also transported to Auschwitz, and I was never to see my parents again. In his book, The Happiest Man on Earth, Eddie Jakey recounts his survival and then misery after the war, until he and his wife started a family. Through all my years, I have learned this life can be beautiful if you make it beautiful. 80 years ago, I didn't think I will have a wife and children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And this is a blessing. Family, he says, is key, as are friends. Friendship is priceless. Shared sorrow is half sorrow. But shared pleasure is double. <laughs> Truths hard-earned from a man entitled to bitterness and resentment. I speak about happiness. I speak what life can be. If you're healthy, you're a multi-millionaire. And that is happiness, says Eddie, a choice available to all of us. I want to make this world a better place for everyone. I want everyone to take a step back and say, we are here for all of us. What a message in this time wow. as we're all in a kind of a state of recovery. You mm -hmm. see what this man endured. He walks into Auschwitz with his parents. He never sees them oh. again. Mm. Never sees them again. I want that book. I want to take that book off your lap. <laughs> and there's a lot of pages <laughs> oh, marked it, yeah. underlined. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, great Beautiful. stuff. And what he said about friendship yeah. as well. Uh, we should mention that uh, Eddie's book, The Happiest Man on Earth, that book is out right now. Yeah. Yeah. Thank he you can have love in his heart, surely yeah. everyone can. Yeah. Right? Can I read one Amazing. little section? Yes, please. A second? Okay. He says, life is not always happiness. Sometimes there are many hard days. But you must remember that you are lucky to be alive. We are lucky in this way. Every breath is a gift. Life is beautiful if you let it be. Mm. Happiness is in your hands. Mm. Oh. That's good. <laughs> For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Right now on NBC News Now. Here in Chicago, about 20,000 middle schoolers returning to school today. They also took advantage of existing vaccine distribution networks throughout Alaska. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Ready actors. An indie horror film, a talented young actress, and a deadly shot. Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Role. Action! Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. Our across America journey here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. Kentucky. Cleveland. Reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow of a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Tonight, the CDC's new outdoor mask guidelines. What change that allowed this new recommendation to be made? If we do nothing, what happens to a city like Houston? You're going to repeat this movie over and over again. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. We're going to do our part and get vaccinated live. A very special naturalization ceremony. This is a really inspiring group. Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! In February of 1965, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stopped through a little speck of a town in Alabama called G's Bend. That night, he told the crowd, most of them direct descendants of slaves who had worked the land there, quote, I've come over here to G's Bend to tell you, you are somebody. Boy, was he right. For generations, the women of G's Bend have been making beautiful quilts that have hung in museums across the country and now are earning the artists their due. NBC's Blaine Alexander has our Sunday Spotlight. If you drive too fast, you could almost miss G's Bend, Alabama. 
There is just one main road. Population doesn't even hit 300. But it holds a tradition so sacred, it's woven into the very fabric of this former plantation. It's a fun thing having a bunch of us quilt together because uh, we can talk about things. Here, quilting is basically a birthright. You're raised under the quilt first because when you're young, after you start walking or whatever they tell you, get under that quilt because they're quilting. Mary Margaret Petway got the gift from her mother. When I was growing up, we took it for granted. Everybody had to keep warm, so everybody made quilts. We didn't know that they were works of art. Sure, you've likely never been to G's Bend. But if you think that you've never seen these works of art, think again. That famous portrait of Michelle Obama? Check out the pattern on her skirt. The quilts have been displayed in Atlanta's High Museum of Art and even the Met. My mother's quilt is hanging in the Met. They got this quilt here hanging up here out, you know. And I'm going, I remember when I used to sleep under this thing. It's just shocked me because people actually see these quilts and talk about how much they are works of art. I never saw it. Despite that acclaim, G's Bend is a town still steeped in poverty. When we were growing up, seriously, everybody had a lot of nothing. But that started to change when recently these colorful creations caught the eye of Rebecca Van Bergen. Her organization, Nest, supports artists and creatives all over the world. It's also important to remember that the G Spen quilters are incredible, but they're part of a much larger community of very talented black, brown, indigenous makers all over this country that deserve this type of recognition. Now that recognition comes with the launch of a new Etsy shop, transforming these artists into entrepreneurs, some quilts fetching more than $10,000. It's overwhelming. Every, just about every store on Etsy is empty. Did you see these as voices that had been almost silenced for so long? Yes, absolutely. And I think that um, most certainly if they had been white quilters in, a, in their age and time, their rise in notoriety and the economic benefit would have been much, much faster. You know, the reward for quilting, the end product. Everything else is truly icing on the cake, and some of it's got cherries on top. But the end product, you take time and get your hand and you rub it across that quilt. You kind of feel like quilt come to life. A new life for these priceless patterns, now bringing history and art to market. For Sunday Today, Blaine Alexander, Atlanta. Their work is beautiful. Blaine, thank you very much. I joined Ellen on her set, what's been a difficult year for her personally and for her show. Very few people go through such huge public humiliation. How can I be an example of strength and perseverance if I give up and run away? Our Across America journey here in Louisville, Kentucky. Cleveland. Reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow of a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. right. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. right. We're going to do our part and get vaccinated live. A very special naturalization ceremony. This is a really inspiring group. Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. I joined Ellen on her set, what's been a difficult year for her personally and for her show. Very few people go through such huge public humiliation. How can I be an example of strength and perseverance if I give up and run away? It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Right now on NBC News Now. They've done things like installing cameras to help alert Border Patrol to people crossing. They are escaping a number of conditions there, uh, violence and persecution in their home countries. It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high-profile attention to the issue. 
What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. We're back with a lot more from Cleveland as Al turns his attention to the restaurant restart there. Good Eats there. Mm -hmm. Hell, you betcha, Savannah. You know better than most when we were here back in 2016. But like many restaurants, there's a special place here that's been forced to think outside the box to make very different uh, decisions during difficult times. And as you're about to see, at Edwin's Restaurant, they're doing it with equal parts food and purpose that makes them a standout among Cleveland's top culinary destinations. In the hospitality business, First impressions are all important. Here at Edwin's Restaurant on Shaker Square, at the border of Cleveland and Shaker Heights. I want you to miss this out, okay? Owner Brandon Trostowski bets on that success every single day. A reminder about winning is written high above the kitchen staircase. When you first look, you see a fine dining restaurant. But look a little closer, and it's a restaurant that offers more than French cuisine. It offers second chances. I received a break when I was 18 going on 19, and the judge gave me probation instead of a long sentence. And from there, I uh, found a chef who mentored me. And from there, I changed my stars. So we're getting closer. And the stars of many others. Krastowski, having worked in Michelin-starred kitchens in Paris and New York, decided to create the Edwin's Leadership and Restaurant Institute. It hit me that I have to give this break back. Edwin's, short for Education Wins. It's a six-month culinary training program specifically designed for formerly incarcerated men and women. We're not asking about what you did. Whatever it may be, we're looking at taking you to where you want to go. Applications pour in from all around the country folks eager to learn the nuts and bolts about the industry. You're going to learn every position in the restaurant, dining room and kitchen. Camelia Prosser is a student in the program. Rufus Hill, a seven-year alum who recently joined the kitchen line as a sous chef, both saying the program is no cakewalk. I was frustrated at times. It was times I wanted to quit. But just people here that's like, it's more than just like co-workers. They like really passionate about helping people. What does distillation actually mean? It takes a lot of hard work. It's worth it. It's not easy, but it's, it's as hard as you make it. Water boils at 212. There it is. Camelia, a mom of two, is studying wine and spirits, grateful for the opportunity to put their past behind them and look forward to the future. You know, we're not the ones that society is really looking at to succeed. You know, but Brandon and his staff, they, they made it a way where not only do you come and get educated, but you get a sense of guidance. Within the last decade, the school has grown into a campus with a bakery and a butcher shop offering free student housing and recreation. 95% of the graduates coming out of here are walking right into a job. And right now we have a waiting list of probably 45 restaurants who want to hire a grad. The rate at which you return back to prison nationally is nearly 50% or less than 1%. What fulfills me and what makes me excited every day is someone being alive, someone surviving, and someone achieving their, their goal. That's all I need. And joining us now is Edwin's owner, Brandon Trosowski, and two of his employees, uh, Azare Davis and Justin Smith. Good morning. Thanks for being here, guys. Good morning, Al. Good morning. Thank, Thank you. Pleasure. So, so uh, I, I know you guys go by Ray and Jay, so we'll, <laughs> we'll go by that. Uh, uh, so, so, Ray, let me ask you first. What was this like? What does this, this opportunity mean for you? Um, it means a lot for me. It's uh, opening up new doors, learning new skills, um, Definitely structure, discipline for me. So it's just, it's a big experience for me, something different. And Jay, how has this changed your life? Tremendously, actually. Um, I just recently been released and, and from prison and because of this man and this program, uh, seeing second chances of just being, uh, giving me a second chance. Uh, and because of Brandon, I'm home today. Uh, so this, it, it's changed my life and my outlook of what I want to do in life. Uh, and I got goals and focusing on my, my business myself. Because this Brandon, man. This, I mean, you, you're, you're helping dreams come true. Sure. Uh, uh, most people wouldn't think you could pull this off while you're doing <laughs> fine French dining. Yeah, 
Well, hey, a couple reasons. One, it's um, it's what I know best, right? Uh-huh. But uh, most importantly, it's what we could all aspire to, right? I mean, there's greatness inside all of us. So all it takes is that chance and that and that proper training, and Absolutely. you know, as Ray and. And Justin can attest to that. Yes. Give the chance, give the guidance, and, and we can hit that mark. What's some of the stuff you've got here? Well, you know, hey, listen, Al, some say it's a mirror that reflects your soul. Uh-huh. But, but actually, a little bit of rabbit right in front of you there. We have the scalps with, with, with the zoto. We have the frog legs or quista granui and the artichokes. And under that dome uh-huh. is our chocolate pyramid if you want to do the big reveal. Ooh. <laughs> well, hold on a sec. Well, make sure you dip it in there. Guys. That's pure chocolate. I had the Tommy's of- chocolate shake, and now I've got the chocolate pyramid. <laughs> wow. There you are. And that's why this is the greatest location in the nation. (laughs) Brandon, Azare, Justin, thank you. Thank Thank you. you. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Right now on NBC News Now. Here in Chicago, about 20,000 middle schoolers returning to school today. They also took advantage of existing vaccine distribution networks throughout Alaska. actors an indie horror film a talented young actress and a deadly shot dateline's newest podcast killer role action subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts Today, our search for kindness takes us to the story behind a life-changing wish. Justin Wang from Pleasanton, California, spent much of his childhood in and out of hospitals. So when the Make-A-Wish Foundation gave him the chance to pursue one of his passions, Justin jumped, and now he's paying it forward. Take a look. My love for food comes from my love for creativity. I think everyone loves food, whether it's cooking it or just eating it. It's one of life's simple joys. 18-year-old Justin Wang doesn't take life's simple joys for granted. Throughout his childhood, he dealt with chronic heart failure, which affected his overall health. Being a kid and having to deal with heart failure was very, very impactful towards my life. It made me different from my peers and my classmates. He has to go to uh, hospitals and do procedures and sometimes He couldn't go to school just because of a simple flu code. In 2018, Justin's health took a drastic turn, and he needed a heart transplant to save his life. That was an incredibly soul-shattering moment for me, just because it turned everything upside down. Thankfully, just two weeks later, in the middle of the night, Justin got great news from his parents, Yang and Lin Wang. They told me, they have a heart waiting for you. They had a heart waiting for you. I was like, no way, but it was real. I think the hospital was a little bit more beautiful that night. To me, it's like a miracle. It's a precious gift from our donor. Following the surgery, Justin experienced great pain, but found joy in watching cooking videos from content creators like Claire Saffitz. Can I say it? Action and Rie McClenney. Today, it's going to be just me cooking. And cooking quickly became a part of his recovery. The doctor come in and look at him. Oh, Justin, what is cooking today? So they would uh, exchange the recipes, what they like to eat. At the time, going to walk to the pots and pans, going to get ingredients from the fridge was exercise for myself. Cooking really helped me with post-transplant recovery. During this time, he was granted a wish with the Make-A-Wish Foundation, and he had the perfect idea. When you do have a transplant, you have a special diet. So I wish for a cookbook, a heart-healthy cookbook, that I could use and bring to my own health 
and bring to my own recovery. So the Make-A-Wish Foundation paired Justin with chef Victoria La Cuesta, a personal chef who specializes in healthy eating. He loves Asian cuisine. Asian cuisine is very salty. And, and one of the things I kind of try to work with him and his mom was introducing low sodium ingredients and making things more flavorful. She taught me that you can actually use less soy sauce and you can always incorporate veggies. I think that those are the most important and valuable lessons I learned from her. And I still use those techniques to this day. When I see other people eating my food and enjoying it, you know, it's like, gosh, yes. It's an amazing feeling. Today, Justin and Yang continue to work with Make-A-Wish to grant wishes to kids just like him. Make-A-Wish is able to give us something good in this world. And I think that's very important because we can't lose hope while fighting these diseases. Justin has changed his character tremendously from before the transplant, before Make-A-Wish, to what he is now. It's just uh, unbelievable. He I am so grateful to my donor. Every breath I take and every moment that I do is because of them and their generous gift. And we are so happy because Aww. Justin is here. Our studio is a little brighter with yeah. you in it, <laughs> Justin. Justin. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Hello, you guys. Justin, what we love, we're great because you're here, but what we love is that <laughs> your life changed and instead of just taking, you've decided to give back. How awesome is Make-A-Wish to you? It's really an amazing organization. I feel just blessed being a part of it and blessed being a part of the community that Make-A-Wish provides for me and other Wish kids. Well, I think it's it's amazing. And by the way, this heart healthy business of giving back is brilliant. You've got three good looking meals. What do you have in front of you? So I have my chicken chow mein that's heart healthy, my pan set, mm -hmm. and my soba noodles of tofu. Yum. Can we have those? We want them all. Can you Please. pass them through the Zoom? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I will. I will pass them uh, here. Thank Give you. It to you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Justin. Well, Justin, we wanted to share a little something with you. Subaru mm -hmm. of America admires your commitment to make a wish of the Greater Bay Area. So they're donating $11,000 to help you grant more wishes. Go, Justin. Oh, Go, my Justin. God. What do you think? How is that going to help? That means just so much to me. Thank you so much. Oh. I, I, I'm i speechless. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, oh, that's amazing. Thank you so much. And Make-A-Wish really deserves this money. They are such an amazing organization. I cannot thank you enough. Oh. Well, Justin, we think you're amazing. Uh, keep doing good work, okay? I will try to make you, you guys you, proud. Oh, you are you are, you are. You are. All right, let's check out Justin's <laughs> recipes. Go to today.com slash food. And for his cookbook, Justin's Heart hearty recipes head to today.com yes i know what shop. i'm gonna get we need Me we too. all need that book thank you so much justin they would just make jokes and say well we had to get a pretty one so we had to step outside to get a pretty one in the family growing up lisa wright always knew she belonged you knew you were adopted right yeah my mom told me and your mommy loved you she was really young and she knew she couldn't take care of you. I wanted a baby so bad, that's why your mom let me take care of you. You weren't abandoned, this was just the best thing for you. Her adoption records were sealed and Lisa never tried to find her biological family. It's done in complete secrecy, so she had no idea who my birth parents were. So when Lisa's son suggested she take a DNA test at age 54 to find out her genetic heritage, she didn't expect it would change her life. So you take this DNA test and then you find out you have a family match. I get an alert and it says, this person is your uncle. So I just kind of reached out and said, if you're open to it, I would love to chat with you to see what all of this means. A few days later, they spoke on the phone. You know, my heart's like turning flips. He goes, you know, tell me about yourself. What do you know? So I said, well, I was born on December the 10th, 1964. I was told that my biological mom was very young when she had me. She moved to LA because she wanted to be in Hollywood. And then he just stopped me right there. So then I'm thinking, okay, here it comes. He's gonna say, don't ever call me again. He goes, Lisa. You're my niece. We've been looking for you. We've all been looking for you. And the surprises didn't stop there. I say, well, where is my mother? And he goes, oh, 
she lives in LA. And I went, oh my God, because so do I. I Google her on my computer and her picture pops up. I just could not believe it. Like for the first time ever, other than looking at my son, for the first time, I'm looking at somebody who looks like me. Five minutes later, Lisa got another call. A voice on the other end says, is this my daughter? Oh. And, and then I just went, oh my God, is this my mother? She goes, yes, sweetie, this is your mom. It was just the most indescribable feeling. I'm talking to my mother. Like I'm, I'm talking to my mother. After more than 50 years of separation, Lisa and her mother, Lynn Moody, didn't waste any time making plans. She goes, well, when can I see you? And I'm like, whenever you want, right? And she goes, how about tomorrow? For Lynn, who never had more children, it was a reunion she dreamed of, but never expected. So when she was born, they covered my face, my eyes, so that I couldn't see her but I could hear her cry. All I could say was, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, baby, I'm sorry. And as a mother, you never, ever, ever forget. During those 50 years, all I did was try to learn how to live with it. I didn't know if she was hungry, if she was alive, if she was happy, if she was adopted. When I found out that she was my daughter, at that moment, it was like I was giving birth because I lost my legs, I was on the floor in a fetal position, screaming and crying. So I didn't know how deep that hole was. I didn't know how deep that hole was. Not only did Lynn finally have her daughter, she learned she had a grandson too. <laughs> and in a final twist, fit for Hollywood, Lisa discovered she'd actually grown up watching her actress mother on TV. I grew up watching my mother on TV and didn't even know it. So that is insane. So that's my mama. That was our must-see TV. We all sat down and watched That's My Mama every week. And who knew? No idea. And you know, it's like, oh, Michelle, show that's my mama. And then like, and that's my mama. <laughs> Especially yeah. around Mother's Day. What would your takeaway be for, for someone? Life is full of surprises sometimes. So hang in there no matter what your circumstances are. Be open to miracles. Be open to surprises. And keep the faith. What's going on, our Today All Day friends? We're so happy you